Good evening. The name of my presentation is the JFK Medical Cover-Up, Events at Bethesda Naval Hospital on November 22, 1963. Now I've provided you with a summary slide uh, indicating that there have been six JFK medical inquiries uh, since the assassination in 1963. The first, of course, was the Warren Commission impaneled uh, very late in 1963. They did almost all of their work in 1964 and published in September of 64. Next came uh, a rather strange report signed in uh, January 1967. I've always called it the military review because the three military pathologists who did JFK's autopsy are the people who signed it. And yet they were called together by the Justice Department. Uh, and it appears that the Justice Department actually wrote the report or large segments of it. And then the doctors simply signed it as directed. Uh, the purpose of this uh, report was to marry up the autopsy photographs and x-rays, which had not been cataloged officially until November 1966 to marry them up with the autopsy report written in 1963. Now, Attorney General Ramsey Clark convened a review panel of the medical evidence in 1968. And uh, in 1975, there was a one-man review of uh, the medical evidence by Dr. Werner Spitz of the Rockefeller Commission staff. Now, the House Select Committee on Assassinations, the HSCA, uh, performed a major reinvestigation of the medical evidence. And uh, they were in business from 1976 through 1978 and published their work in 1979. The Assassination Records Review Board, the ARRB, was in business for four years from 1994 to 1998 and I was a member of the staff of that body. I was hired to work on the military records team and was later promoted to head the military records team. You need to understand that formal reinvestigation of the JFK assassination was not permitted by Congress in the JFK Records Act. The Congress wanted the review board to locate and to declassify to the maximum extent possible all records reasonably related to the JFK assassination. But as I say, they did not authorize reinvestigation. They did not desire that. Nevertheless, uh, the review board staff did conduct a lot of what I would call extra credit work in the medical evidence arena. Why? Because Congressman Lewis Stokes from Cleveland, Ohio, who formerly had chaired the HSCA in the 1970s. Uh, Congressman Stokes met with the five uh, board members in 1993, shortly before the ARRB was impaneled and admitted to them that very few people, if any, were satisfied with the work of the HSCA in the medical evidence field. He strongly encouraged the board members to do all they could to clarify the record in the area of the medical evidence. And they listened to his uh, request. The review board staff conducted many unsworn medical interviews and also conducted 10 uh, depositions of persons present at or associated with the autopsy on President Kennedy. They also conducted one deposition of a group of Dallas treating physicians. So there are a total of 11 uh, deposition transcripts that were placed in the National Archives uh, in 1998, along with the uh, interview reports of all of our unsworn witnesses. And uh, they were placed in the archives without comment because uh, I remind you the review board was not allowed to reinvestigate, which means they were not allowed to come up with findings of fact 
in regard to what happened. So those items are in the archives for the American people to study and decide for themselves what they mean. And in a sense, that's what this presentation is all about. It's an attempt to explain uh, to you the significant ways that the uh, medical evidentiary landscape has changed uh, since the uh, work of the ARRB was completed. There's been one really seminal article published, I think, about the five investigations that met before the review board went into business. It was published in 2003 by Dr. Gary Aguilar and his colleague, Kathleen Cunningham. It was titled, How Five Investigations into JFK's Autopsy and Medical Evidence Got It Wrong. And uh, I would highly recommend it to anyone who wants to understand the history of these investigations and uh, how they built on each other, how they differed from each other, and how the interpretation of the conflicted evidence has evolved over time. Now, it will soon become apparent that I've pursued a certain methodology uh, in building this presentation. My primary focus has been on these elements. Chain of custody and timelines, I repeat, chain of custody and timelines. Who saw what and when? And who did what and when? I examined and analyzed descriptions before and after major changes were noted in President Kennedy's wounds. I do that to determine what happened during crucial events by comparing these changes in his wounds seen by different people at different times on November 22nd. In short, I believe I'm following basic police investigative procedure. Now the tools used have included the bootleg autopsy photos. There are two collections, one black and white, one color, and two skull x-ray images published by the HSCA in black and white on paper. If you wanna know more about the bootleg autopsy photos, we can do that during the Q&A following this presentation. Uh, we need to rely on those because the Kennedy family will not allow anyone to reproduce the uh, original images in the National Archives. So we're fortunate that we have two bootleg collections. And having seen the collection 16 times myself on different occasions, I can tell you that all of the bootleg autopsy photos that I'll be showing you do depict what's in the archives. It's just that some of them are a little bit cropped. Some of the uh, borders are cut off and that uh, some of them suffer from a contrast buildup. Uh, but they are accurate depictions in general of uh, what's in the archives. There are 52 postmortem photographs overall, 25 black and white negatives and 27 color positive transparency. They're all four inch by five inches in size, four by five inches, large format film. Of these only 38 are of JFK's body and 14 are images of a brain. I've relied on official reports, some written by the FBI, the US Marine Corps, the autopsy report itself, of course, the casket team, Gawler's funeral home, and there's even one memo uh, from CBS News that I've uh, relied upon. Witness recollections are crucial uh, as recorded in uh, doctor's treatment notes, autopsy notes, unsworn interviews, and sworn testimony. And the sworn testimony comes from three sources, the Warren Commission, the HSCA, and the ARRB. Now, to understand Bethesda, you must begin in Dallas with what was seen at Parkland Hospital. At Parkland, the medical staff attempted to save JFK's life with emergency treatment. An autopsy was not performed. Only two wounds were directly observed by the treatment staff at Parkland. A small penetrating entrance wound in the throat, 
and a blowout widely interpreted as an exit wound in the right rear of the head. Now let's return to the entrance wound in the throat. It was about the width of a pencil, just below the larynx or Adam's apple, but above the shirt collar and just to the right of the midline. The best witnesses to this were Dr. Carrico, the first doctor to see President Kennedy in trauma room one, and Dr. Perry, uh, the man who performed the tracheotomy on his throat to help him breathe. Now, Dr. Carrico, in his treatment notes, called it a small penetrating wound, indicating that it was pushed inward from the outside to the inside, as if it were an entry wound, and it was small and round and not large and uh, jagged. When he was interviewed by Harold Weisberg uh, uh, for Harold Weisberg's book, Postmortem, uh, Carrico confirmed that yes, the wound was above the top edge of the shirt collar. Uh, Dr. Perry appeared at a post-death press conference along with his colleague, Dr. Kemp Clark on November 22nd in the afternoon. Dr. Perry stated that the wound in the throat was an entry coming from the front three different times in the Parkland press conference. Uh, the videotapes of that press conference, which went out on national television, were confiscated uh, shortly afterward by the US Secret Service. However, we do have a verbatim record of what these two men said. It exists in White House transcript 1327C, uh, which was recorded by a White House staffer and is now readily available online. A blowout, widely interpreted as an exit wound in the right rear of the head, uh, was about the size of a baseball or a small orange. Terms used by the treating physicians were occipital parietal and occipital temporal. Soon we'll be looking at uh, drawings from anatomy textbooks and skull models to help you understand what these terms mean. Uh, what does occipital parietal mean and what does occipital temporal mean, and is there much of a difference between the two? Now, both wounds implied shots from the front, which was in complete opposition to what later became the official story of a shooter firing from above and behind the Texas School Book Depository. This is Nurse Audrey Bell's wound diagram that she made for the ARRB in 1997. She was the chief operating room nurse at Parkland Hospital, and she observed President Kennedy's treatment for about five minutes in trauma room one before she went off to assist with Governor Connolly's wound. As you can see, uh, the wound she recalls on President Kennedy's head was in the lower right rear of his head. This uh, diagram from Grant's Anatomy shows that the occipital bone is squarely in the back of your head. It's where you would lay your head on the pillow. Uh, above and to the right of it is the right parietal bone. Above and to the left of the occipital bone is the left parietal bone. Uh, the occipital bone separated from the parietal bones by the lamboid suture, and the parietal bones are separated by the sagittal suture. So Nurse Bell's recollection was of a wound that was entirely occipital. This diagram depicts Dr. Charles Crenshaw's wound diagram that he made for us in 1997. His wound is a little bit higher than Audrey Bell's. Uh, it's occipital and slightly parietal. It's still in the rear of the head. It's still in the right rear of the head. And uh, he was the third year resident who was in trauma room one uh, for the entire treatment period. He administered the cut down on the president's right leg, uh, providing intravenous fluids for the president. Now here are the medical procedures performed in Dallas. It's important that we understand what was done and what was not done. A tracheotomy was performed by Dr. Perry to assist with breathing. Remember the president had a bullet entry wound in his throat and there was a lot of blood inside his trachea and, and uh, the airway was blocked. So uh, a small lateral incision was made through the bullet wound in the throat, which was only 2.5 to three centimeters wide. But keep in mind how small this is. Uh, 
one inch equals 2.54 centimeters. So this incision was <clears throat> only a little bit more than an inch wide. <clears throat> Excuse me. A breathing tube was inserted inside the incision. It had two flanges on it, one on the inside, one on the outside to hold it in place. And a breathing machine performed respiration artificially. No surgery was performed on JFK's skull. Closed chest massage and intravenous injection of fluids were performed in the right ankle and the left arm. Now these fluids were initially Ringer's lactate and later type O, pH negative blood, and hydrocortisone. Now, Dr. Clark said at the post-death press conference that JFK was treated for approximately 40 minutes. It's unclear whether this is precisely true or whether he was exaggerating. Uh, and the reason we're not sure is that the official time of death was recorded on the Dallas death certificate as one o'clock PM. Now, this was possibly backdated by as much as 20 minutes if Dr. Clark was correct because JFK arrived outside the hospital at 1238, according to admission records, and in trauma room one at 1243, according to Dr. Clark's treatment notes. In any case, for all practical purposes, JFK was essentially dead on arrival. He had slow agonal respiration. He was cyanotic, that means he was turning blue, he had no pulse, no blood pressure, no electrocardial activity, and approximately one third of the brain was missing. This was an estimate made later for the Warren Commission by Dr. McClellan. Now I want you to remember this observation, it's crucial to understanding where the head wound really was. Cerebellar tissue, tissue from the cerebellum was seen extruding from the head wound and falling out onto the treatment cart by Drs. Clark, Jenkins, and McClelland. Uh, Drs. Clark and Jenkins wrote about this in their typed uh, treatment notes from November 22nd. Dr. McClelland gave a vivid description of this to the Warren Commission in the spring of 1964. Kemp Clark was the head of neurosurgery and the man who pronounced President Kennedy dead. And he reliably reported both cerebral and cerebellar tissue extruding from JFK's head wound. Dr. McClellan testified in 1964 that he saw cerebellar brain tissue, tissue from the right cerebellum, falling out of the head and onto the treatment cart, and that, in his estimation, about one third of the brain was missing posteriorly in the back. The breathing tube was removed after death, and, a, and the small tracheotomy incision closed of its own volition. No photos were taken inside trauma room one at Parkland Hospital. Now I want you to uh, note the location of the cerebellum on the left in the photo below. Uh, the cerebellum is red in the model that you see on the left. The cerebrum is painted blue gray. So most of the surface of your brain is the cerebrum. The cerebellum is a totally separate section of the brain with very different type of tissue located below the cerebrum in the lower back of your head. Now the location of the cerebellum on the human body is entirely consistent with the wound diagrams made by Audrey Bell and Charles Crenshaw, which show a wound low in the right rear of the head or at the most midway up the right rear of the head. They're entirely consistent with each other. The model in the middle shows the occipital bone in red. You can see it squarely in the back of your head. And the right parietal bone is painted light gray. So, uh, and below the right parietal bone is in pink is the right temporal bone, which uh, surrounds the, the, uh, the ear, forward and behind the auditory canal. So you can see that a description that of a rear head wound that was occipital parietal is not very much different from a description that's occipital temporal. An occipital temporal wound uh, would be just a little bit lower in the right rear of the head than an occipital parietal wound. And the descriptions uh, used both terminologies. 
and the skull just to the right of the middle, uh, you'll see that there's a hole in the back of the head and you can see the blue gray uh, cerebral tissue and part of the red cerebellum. Now this is the exact size of the exit defect. <coughs> Excuse me. This is the exact size of the exit defect uh, that Dr. Carrico gave to it in his Warren Commission testimony in the spring of 1964. Remember, the president's lying on his back and uh, brain tissue, both cerebral and, and cerebellar, are, are extruding from this wound as he's lying on his back and falling out onto the treatment car. Now, Dr. Boswell, uh, one of the three military pathologists, uh, was asked to draw on a skull model uh, during his deposition. We'll be examining uh, that sketch later. Uh, we wanted him to draw the extent of the missing bone in President Kennedy's head. So when he looked at the skull model, which was identical to this one, he, uh, he told us that President Kennedy's skull was larger than this and that this skull model was smaller than President Kennedy's cranium. So my point here is that uh, although I've drawn the exact size of the uh, exit wound in the back of the head, uh, proportionately on President Kennedy's head, it would have appeared smaller because President Kennedy's head was bigger than this skull model. We'll discuss the skull on the right and what it depicts at a later time in this lecture. Now, there was an important bone fragment found in Dealey Plaza on Saturday, November 23rd, 1963. It was found by Billy Harper, a pre-med student, and therefore became known as the Harper fragment. He took it to his uncle, a pathologist, Jack Harper, and Jack Harper shared it with two of his pathologist colleagues at the hospital where he worked in Dallas. Those colleagues were Dr. Cairns, the head of pathology, and then Jack Harper, and then his colleague, uh, Gerald Noteboom. Uh, fortunately, they followed correct procedure and photographed the bone fragment. They confirmed that it was human skull bone. They said it was reasonably fresh. The bone, the uh, blood was fresh on the bone fragment. You can see from these two photographs reproduced by the HSCA that it's a little bit more than uh, two and a half inches wide. On the left, you see the exterior surface. On the right, the interior surface. Now, this skull fragment has disappeared, unfortunately. So all we have are these photographs that were taken in 1963, and I believe uh, one x-ray taken of the fragment. Uh, the, the FBI uh, held on to these photographs and to this x-ray of the fragment for years and uh, didn't do anything improper. They held on to the evidence, and you can see them today in the National Archives if you make a request. Uh, the House Select Committee didn't want this to be occipital bone from the back of the head because they didn't want to believe that there was a hole in the back of the head. They deferred to the autopsy photographs, which show no such hole. And uh, therefore, they decided the Harper fragment was from the right parietal region, the right side of the head. But they never held the bone in their hands and examined it in person, like Cairns, Harper, and Noteboom. So I defer to the three doctors who held the bone in their hands. The FBI reports, uh, the interviews of these men survive today. And the HSCA staff interviewed Dr. Cairns in the late 70s, and he was insistent that it was occipital bone. Now, the transportation of JFK's body from Parkland and Dallas to Bethesda in Maryland uh, is an important subject. Let's discuss how the body was wrapped before it left Dallas. JFK was wrapped in two sheets, one around the body, another around the head. No zippered body bag was used at Parkland Hospital. I make this point because later JFK was removed from a zippered body bag at Bethesda. But everyone at uh, Parkland Hospital is unanimous in that no zippered body bag was used at Parkland Hospital. A plastic mattress cover was used, but only to line the interior of the casket. JFK's body was placed on top of the mattress cover, not inside it. The casket uh, he was placed into 
was ornate, heavy, all metal, and bronze. It was a viewing coffin. It was a very heavy, dark brown metal viewing casket, and it weighed over 400 pounds empty. There was a serious altercation at Parkland Hospital between the Dallas County Coroner, Dr. Earl Rose, and the US Secret Service as the Secret Service absconded with the president's body. Dr. Rose uh, valiantly insisted on a Texas autopsy, which was required by Texas law. The Secret Service refused permission for him to do this and ended up removing the body by force after a violent and profane argument ensued and guns were drawn. Now imagine this, the president's casket was on top of a church truck, a wheeled conveyance used to move caskets. And uh, the president's widow was walking alongside of it. The church truck is being pushed by secret service agents. Dr. Rose stands in the door and refuses to let them leave. He says he has to do a Texas autopsy by law. And they inform him uh, after considerable use of profanity and threats that if he didn't get out of the way, he would be run over by the casket. Uh, you can see this recollection by Dr. Peters in the documentary, The Men Who Killed Kennedy. And uh, ambulance driver Aubrey Reich has uh, spoken eloquently of how frightened he was and, and at the extreme level of profanity used and disrespect in the presence of the president's widow. Uh, the president was removed uh, eventually because they shoved Dr. Rose up against the wall, pulled their coats aside and showed their handguns in their holsters. One witness even recalled uh, one Secret Service agent pulling out a semi-automatic weapon and brandishing it in the air. So they got away with the body. And uh, of course, the body was bound for Air Force One. Aubrey Reich was the ambulance driver. He helped place President Kennedy in the bronze casket. He felt the sharp bone uh, extruding from the back of his head through the sheet around President Kennedy's head. He could feel that sharp bone as he helped place him in the casket. He said it was so sharp it almost cut his fingers through the sheet. And it was in the back of the head. The ambulance never stopped on the way to Love Field. Uh, Air Force One departed Love Field at 2.47 p.m. Central Standard and flew nonstop to Andrews Air Force Base, just south of Washington, DC. The aircraft arrived at Andrews at six o'clock PM Eastern Standard Time, and its wheels were on the blocks at 6.04 PM. It was a two hour and 13 minute trip, well documented by the Air Force One audio tapes and by a logbook retained at Andrews, recovered by the review board. Now here's an important uh, picture that, uh, I want you to take note of. This is a photo of Air Force One taken shortly after its arrival at Andrews Air Force Base. Note the light gray Navy ambulance parked directly next to the airplane. It's a light gray Pontiac cardiac ambulance. It's not a hearse. It was sent to the hospital because of rumors that LBJ had had a heart attack. It ended up transporting the Dallas casket to Bethesda, although that wasn't the original plan. We're about to discuss a very serious chain of custody problem with the president's body, uh, which begins with the arrival of Air Force One at Andrews Air Force Base and ends uh, at eight o'clock. Uh, what happened and what I'm about to describe are a series of three different casket entries into Bethesda Naval Hospital. That's right, I just said three different casket entries. The time markers for these events, the time of the first casket entry and the time of the third and final casket entry uh, are critical as we develop our timeline of what was happening to the body that night. The formal autopsy did not begin until shortly after eight o'clock PM. So the real question for us to unravel is what happened to JFK's body between the time of the first casket entry and the time of the third entry. There's 85 minutes in that time span, almost 90 minutes. What was happening to his body during that time period? 
that's the key to understanding what really happened at Bethesda. That's why we're going to spend so much time on the chain of custody problem. Now, if you look at the photograph on the left, this is the back cover of uh, my book. I wrote a five volume book in 2009. And uh, the first four volumes were about the medical evidence and a lot of the work done by the review board staff. The fifth volume was about the who and the why. Uh, so this is the back of the, the volume one. And you'll see a picture of the Dallas casket, the bronze viewing casket, as it's being taken up the ramp onto Air Force One at Love Field in Dallas. It's very dark brown in color. You can see the side rails on one side of the casket. There are three ornate handles covered with expensive wood. There's a viewing lid on the top, which is hinged, opens uh, for public viewings off to one side. And you can see how heavy this casket is. Uh, over 400 pounds empty and a man inside that weighs almost 185 pounds. So it's a very heavy load and these agents were struggling, clearly struggling, and they almost dropped it on the way up the airplane. Okay, continuing right along, we're gonna jump into the chain of custody problem now with both feet. Uh, I solicit your attention for the next several slides. We are going to look at autopsy photographs of the president's wounds, and we're going to be comparing how the wounds changed markedly uh, between uh, Parkland and what was observed at Bethesda during the autopsy. But uh, before we get into the photographs, I need everyone to immerse themselves into this chain of custody problem. Those researchers who choose to ignore this problem because it's a little bit complicated or choose to ignore it because the implications are unpleasant, do so at their own peril. So the title of this slide is, The Body's Chain of Custody Was Broken in Route Bethesda Naval Hospital. Now the cardiac ambulance that you've seen in the photograph arrived in front of Bethesda National Naval Medical Center at 6.55 p.m. per Clint Hill. He's, he was a Secret Service agent, uh, as you all know, in Dealey Plaza, and he wrote a report afterwards, and this is the time he gave for the arrival of the light gray Navy ambulance. The newspaper said it was 6.53 p.m. So those are uh, very consistent times, and we can go to the bank with them. Once it arrived out in front of Bethesda, the ambulance did not move for 12 minutes. That's also from the newspapers. It then followed an FBI car around to the morgue loading dock. More about that later. But President Kennedy's body was actually delivered to the morgue loading dock earlier at 6.35 PM. That's 18.35 hours military time in a black hearse. 20 minutes before the light gray Pontiac cardiac ambulance arrived in front of the hospital. This is worth repeating. President Kennedy's body arrived at the morgue loading dock in the back of the hospital 20 minutes earlier than the light gray ambulance arrived out front and it arrived in a different car, a black Cadillac hearse at 6.35 p.m. It arrived in a cheap, lightweight aluminum shipping casket, which was offloaded by a Navy working party in working uniforms led by E-6 Navy Corpsman Dennis David. The shipping casket was placed by the sailors in the morgue anteroom. That's the, the chill box room right outside the morgue proper. And the witnesses to this were Dennis David, uh, one of the members of his working party, Donald Rubentish, who was located years later, Floyd Reby, another Navy corpsman who was assisting with photography, and Paul O'Connor, one of the two Navy corpsmen assisting the autopsy pathologist that night. 20 minutes later, while on his rounds, Dennis David observed the cardiac ambulance at the moment of its arrival in front of Bethesda Naval Hospital. 20 minutes later, after his working party, deposited this cheap shipping casket in the morgue anteroom. He's very clear on the sequence. 
So late that night, uh, Dr. Boswell, one of the two Navy autopsy pathologists, confirmed to Dennis David that JFK's body had indeed been inside the shipping chasm. This is a very important fact. It's a fact. And we need to determine what it means, and we will be. Now, when the shipping casket was opened shortly after its arrival, President Kennedy's body was wrapped differently than it had been when it left Dallas. Navy Corpsman Paul O'Connor recalled for the HSCA and for numerous researcher interviews that the body was encased in a zippered body bag and that when the bag was unzipped, JFK's body was nude except for a sheet wrapped around his head. Now, the review board interviewed uh, Gawler's uh, funeral home mortician, John Van Heusen, who was in the morgue that night, and he recalled seeing a black body bag when he was interviewed by us in 1996. There are two key documents which uh, verify this first uh, early casket entry, the first of three casket entries. Uh, the first one I'll be talking about is the Boysian Report, prepared by United States Marine Corps Sergeant Roger Boysian. And the second will be the Gawler Funeral Home, a document called the First Call Sheet. I know you can't read these two documents on this slide. The point here is just to show you that they do exist and that they're available online at various websites. And now I'll move to the next slide and read you the pertinent excerpts. So the arrival time of the body is confirmed by the Boysian report and the use of the shipping casket uh, is confirmed by the Gawler's first call sheet. Now, uh, looking on the left, uh, Boysian's unit fr was from the Marine Barracks in Washington, DC. It provided physical security for the morgue. They showed up early, well before JFK's body and they reported to Admiral Galloway, the commander of the center. Boysian wrote an after action report on 26 November, 1963, the day after President Kennedy's funeral. He provided uh, an authenticated photocopy of this to the review board in 1997. I interviewed him on the phone. He had an onion skin carbon copy of the report that he typed. He made a photocopy of it, uh, authenticated it on the phone during his interview with me, sent it to me with an attached letter. And the key entry in the report reads like this, quote, at approximately 1835 hours, the casket was received at the morgue entrance and taken inside, end quote. What this does is it pins a precise time on the recollections of Dennis David. Dennis David, the Navy corpsman, uh, began relating his uh, experiences in 1975 and continued uh, thereafter, uh, essentially that uh, he had met a hearse, a black Cadillac uh, mortuary ambulance at the loading dock, and that he and his working party had unloaded a cheap shipping casket, placed it in the morgue anteroom, and then had been told to depart. They did not see that casket open. 20 minutes later, in the front of the hospital, he saw the white Navy ambulance arrive in the front of the hospital. Now the Gawler's first call sheet is a one page working document, which was filled out in this case by three different funeral home employees. It has three different sets of handwriting on it. Uh, the key entry on that page is quote, body removed from metal shipping casket at US Naval Hospital at Bethesda, end quote. Now the word Shipping casket has a specific meaning in the funeral trade. It's a cheap metal case, almost always made of aluminum, used to move bodies on airplanes and trains. It's not ornamental, it's not fancy. It's also lightweight, it's not heavy. Uh, this was authenticated to the review board by uh, Joe Hagen, the man who was the Gawler's funeral home supervisor that night at the morgue. We interviewed him and uh, he authenticated the document to us. And in fact, it's his handwriting that mentions the shipping casket. Now, I told you there were three casket entries that night. Let's talk about the second of the three casket entries. Uh, on the left, I've summarized what happened during the first entry. Let's move over to the column on the right. The second casket entry occurred at approximately 7.17 p.m. Without going into the details, I will just tell you that that time is inferred from an internal FBI report. 
an FBI interview of its own agents uh, a couple of years later by Mr. Rosen. It's called the Rosen Report. The second casket entry uh, involved the heavy ornate bronze viewing coffin from Dallas, dark brown metal. Remember, this is in comparison with a light, lightweight, pinkish gray aluminum shipping casket that was uh, offloaded at 635. Now this second entry was handled not by Navy sailors, but by four federal agents, four agents all by themselves. Secret Service agents Kellerman and Greer, the same two men who were in the front of the president's limousine in Dealey Plaza, and FBI agents Seibert and O'Neill, uh, Jim Seibert and Frank O'Neill. All four men were wearing business suits and ties, and they removed the heavy Dallas casket from the light gray cardiac ambulance and placed it on a wheeled conveyance called a church truck and moved it into the anteroom outside the morgue. So let's remember, this is four federal agents, men in suits, compared to the previous casket entry, which was a working party of sailors. Sailors wearing working uniform, which would have been black trousers and black shirts, or navy blue, if you will, navy blue trousers and navy blue shirts. Uh, totally different uh, set of actors wearing different clothing. Now, the obvious implication of this is that the Dallas casket during this second casket entry had to be empty. There's no way around this. Let's keep moving. This slide's a little busy. I'll highlight the important aspects of it for you. You can go back and revisit it later when the presentation is online. The two FBI agents, Seibert and O'Neill, who helped to move the Dallas casket on the church truck, were initially not allowed to enter the morgue and they were sequestered in another location. Now this is from their, this quote is from their November 26th FBI FD302 report. Researchers call it the Cybert O'Neill Report. Quote, a tight security was immediately placed around the autopsy room by the Naval facility and the US Secret Service. Bureau agents made contact with Mr. Roy Kellerman, the Assistant Secret Service agent in charge of the White House detail and advised him of the Bureau's interest in this matter. End quote. Uh, this is clearly bureaucratic language indicating that they were not allowed to go into the morgue. Uh, and it's written in their report for CYA purposes. Now, many years later, uh, both FBI agents denied to the review board in 1997 that they had been initially barred from the morgue, but this falsehood was contradicted by comments Dr. Humes made. Dr. Humes was the chief pathologist at the autopsy. Comments he made to his close friend, Jim Snyder of CBS. These comments made their way into a January 10th, 1967 internal CBS memo. The memo reads in part, quote, Humes said FBI agents were not in the autopsy room during the autopsy. They were kept in an anteroom, end quote. So part of what the FBI agents said to the review board was untrue. And part of what Humes wrote excuse me, part of what Hume said to his neighbor, Jim Snyder of CBS was untrue. Uh, Humes said the FBI agents were never in the autopsy room. They were kept in an anteroom. Well, we know that's not true because they were present during the autopsy proper between eight and 11 o'clock. They took copious notes. They uh, used their notes later to write their after action report dated November 26th. But the important clue is here that Hume said they were kept out, kept outside the morgue in the anteroom. So that's how uh, their visit began. They were initially barred from the morgue. The uh, sensitivity of the FBI agents can be explained by the fact that uh, they were told to, quote, stay with the body and to obtain bullets reportedly in the president's body. That was their job. They admitted that in their FD-302 report. So when researcher David Lifton began to question them about being barred from the morgue before the autopsy started, 
they closed ranks back in the 1960s and forevermore engaged in denial. Rather than admit they'd failed to maintain the chain of custody on the body, a key medical legal concept. If you lose the chain of custody on a body, and these agents knew that, it may invalidate the autopsy report, and it may invalidate any evidence removed from the body or evidence subsequently not found in the body may be invalidated. So they never wanted to admit what they were hinting at in clear language in their after action report. Unknown to the two FBI agents at the time, the Dallas casket was empty anyway, and they had never been with the body since Air Force One had landed at Andrews Air Force Base. The Secret Service was hiding this fact from them because I can assure you that agents Kellerman and Greer who were on Air Force One for the flight back, they knew it was empty. The FBI agents did not know that. Now a third casket entry occurred at eight o'clock PM. That's 20 hundred hours military time per the official after action report of the military casket team or honor guard. Let's examine the essential facts of this event before I explain what it means. The six man military casket team or honor guard was assembled at Andrews Air Force Base before Air Force One landed at six o'clock PM. It include mem included members of the US Navy, the US Army, the US Air Force, the US Marine Corps and the US Coast Guard. The officer in charge who assembled the team was an Army junior officer, First Lieutenant Samuel Byrd. All members of the casket team wore dress uniforms with white gloves, the dress uniforms of their respective service. They did not wear sidearms or carry guns of any kind, unlike the US Marine Corps security detail from Marine Barracks, which was armed. Now, this honor guard attempted to assist several Secret Service personnel with the confused and uncoordinated unloading of the Dallas casket from Air Force One onto the light gray Navy cardiac ambulance at Andrews Air Force Base. Secret Service agents attempted to push the casket team away from the Dallas casket and prevent them from handling it. And for the most part, they didn't handle it, just one or two members of the team. The Joint Service casket team or honor guard then flew in a helicopter to a helipad in front of Bethesda Naval Hospital. And they lined at about 6.45 PM, 10 minutes prior to the arrival of the Andrews Air Force Base motorcade. So concluding uh, my discussion of the third casket entry, I want you to bear with me here. You can come back and examine this slide in detail later. There was an ambulance chase that took place in the dark after the motorcade from Andrews Air Force Base arrived in front of the hospital. Remember I told you that the motorcade arrived at 6.55 PM. Uh, everybody got out of the car, people like Jackie Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, Secret Service Agent Roy Kellerman, Admiral Berkeley, the president's physician, Secret Service Agent Landis. Uh, they got out of the car and went in the front door of Bethesda immediately. The only person who stayed in the car was the driver, William Greer, Secret Service agent. 12 minutes later, uh, the FBI agent, Cybert and O'Neill, drove up next to Greer and said, why are you sitting here? They knew he had the Dallas casket in his vehicle. And he says, I don't know how to get to the morgue. They said, we know how to get there. We do our physicals here every year, follow us. So he followed them back. They drove back in their car and he followed them back to the morgue uh, loading dock 12 minutes after the car had arrived out front. Meanwhile, the joint service casket team and a pickup truck had taken off after a decoy ambulance. This is a term not invented by researchers, a term used that night at the scene uh, by General Wheel, who is the military uh, district of Washington commandant. So this team and a pickup truck saw a rear admiral getting into a white Navy ambulance. There were two of them that night. There was the one with the Dallas casket in it. There was another white or light gray Navy ambulance. Rear Admiral Galloway is noted by the Washington Post got into a light gray ambulance and drove off quickly into the darkness. The casket team followed him. It was their job to stay with the body of the slain commander in chief and render due honors. Uh, this chase in the darkness was at high speed and it lasted 10 to 15 minutes. And the casket team 
actually lost the light gray ambulance in the darkness. It took them 15 minutes, uh, they were lost, remember, to get back to the front of the hospital in a state of profound embarrassment. And as I say here, the term decoy ambulance was used that night by Lieutenant Byrd after consulting with General Wheel about what was going on. Years later, General Wheel's aide, former Army Lieutenant Richard Lipsy, told the HSCA the same thing. He told them there was a decoy ambulance, it was common knowledge, and it was a security measure. So, this third casket entry, uh, the second entry of the Dallas casket, this third entry takes place at 8 o'clock p.m. It's noted in the uh, casket team's after action report. Uh, the casket team went to the back of the morgue twice. The first time they went back there, they found a light gray ambulance with nothing inside. There was no casket inside. A long time later, they went back again and they found a light gray Navy ambulance with the Dallas casket inside. They, there was nobody in the uh, ambulance either time. They proceeded to remove the casket from the light gray ambulance and they carried it into the morgue at eight o'clock p.m. Many, many people witnessed this event and it's recorded in their report. As soon as they entered the morgue, so did a very large audience of over 35 people. Most of them sat in the three-tiered gallery of bleachers. The large audience included the two FBI agents who had been previously barred from entering the morgue. And uh, many of the people in this large audience uh, witnessed the opening of the Dallas casket shortly after eight o'clock. President Kennedy's body was now inside and the body was now wrapped in a sheet and the head covered by another sheet, just as it had been wrapped when it left Parkland Hospital in Dallas. So you see what's going on here is a shell game with the president's body. We'll talk about why in just a minute. The autopsy formally began with the first incision, the Y incision on the chest, which was made at 8.15 p.m. per the two FBI agents report. Let's review the essentials of the three casket entries. Uh, later on, after this presentation is online, I know you're gonna wanna revisit this subject. It's a complex subject, especially the first time you hear it. This is the slide you'll wanna come back to and re-examine, slide number 20. I've separated the three casket entries here by time, 6.35, 7.17, and eight o'clock. By type of casket, the first entry is the cheap aluminum shipping casket with ugly turnbuckles made of aluminum, no side rails. Uh, the second casket entry is the heavy ornate bronze ceremonial coffin from Dallas. The third casket entry is also the heavy ornate bronze ceremonial coffin from Dallas. Uh, the difference is who carried these things in. The first casket entry was done by Navy sailors, a working party supervised by Dennis David. The second casket entry was carried out by four federal agents, men in suits. The third casket entry was carried out by the military casket team or honor guard, all wearing dress uniforms and white gloves. JFK's body was not in the Dallas casket for casket entry number two, but it had been reintroduced into the casket by the time the casket team was allowed to find it. And by the time they took it in at eight o'clock, JFK's body had been reintroduced into the casket. So here's the summary. The three evolutions are clearly documented as separate events with distinct sets of actors. And the time for each event is distinct and separate from the other two events. The reality of these events cannot be challenged. The task of the researcher is to determine what do they mean. Now the casket shenanigans began on Air Force One prior to takeoff from Dallas. JFK's body must have been removed from the Dallas casket prior to the swearing in of LBJ well before the takeoff from Love Field. This inference was made by David Lefton in his 1981 book, Best Evidence, and I support that inference. The body must have been placed in either the forward or after luggage compartment in the hold of the airplane during a documented luggage transfer of luggage from Air Force Two prior to takeoff. This inference was also made by Lifton and Best Evidence, and I support that inference. So the uh, baggage holds were open on the ground. The forward and aft baggage holds were open, and uh, they did have enough room inside 
to place a body. And uh, it's clear that JFK's body must have been removed from the airplane by probably by a forklift that was observed from the uh, aft starboard door shortly before the swearing in of Lyndon Johnson and then placed in a luggage compartment. So the question is, why would this happen? Why would anybody go to all this trouble for this subterfuge? The reason to me is simple and obvious. The Secret Service feared that County Coroner Earl Rose and the Dallas police might appear at any time and demand a Texas autopsy and demand to take the casket back to Parkland Hospital. So it's now obvious to me that the principal job of the Secret Service, once JFK was dead, was to prevent an honest autopsy in Texas to get JFK's body to Washington, D.C., where the autopsy results could be manipulated. Now, after takeoff, the Dallas casket was surrounded by Kennedy loyalists conducting an Irish wake and was never opened. Now, these casket shenanigans continued on the ground at Andrews Air Force Base immediately after arrival. Here's what was intended per the Air Force One audio tapes. Uh, the newest version of those is called the Clifton Tapes. They contain more conversation than the earlier version released by the LBJ Library in the 1970s. It's still an edited tape, but it contains more conversation than the earlier version. What was intended was to use three helicopters to transfer the entire Kennedy entourage, including Jackie Kennedy, to the south grounds of the White House. That's on the Air Force One tapes. Two helicopters were set aside to go from Andrews Air Force Base to Bethesda Naval Hospital, two helicopters. And they're even identified by tail number by Roy Kellerman on the radio. Secret Service agent Roy Kellerman was told by Gerald Bain, the head of the White House detail, quote, you accompany the body aboard the helicopter, end quote. That's on the Air Force One tapes. Now, here's what actually happened. I've mentioned the cardiac ambulance that was sent to Andrews by Captain Canada at Bethesda because of rumors that LBJ had had a heart attack. Jackie Kennedy saw the cardiac ambulance on the ground next to the airplane and said uh, to her brother-in-law, Bobby Kennedy, we'll go in that, destroying a cleverly crafted covert operation. The public and Jackie Kennedy all believed that JFK was in the Dallas casket, but he was not. What we all witnessed on TV was a charade. JFK's body was spirited to Bethesda in a helicopter as soon as LBJ's helicopter departed Andrews Air Force Base for the White House after the TV coverage at Andrews ended. The helo containing JFK's body landed at the Officers Club parking lot very close to the Bethesda Naval Hospital at about 1830 hours, about 6.30 p.m. It was met by a Cadillac hearse, a black ambulance from the Gawler's funeral home. The body was placed in a black zippered body bag and delivered to the morgue loading dock next door in a cheap metal shipping casket at 1835 hours, 6.35 p.m. as documented by the Boysian report. Now, this slide is very busy. I don't want you to recoil in horror. I, don't, I want you to remember three times. You can come back and study this slide later after the presentation is online. I want you to look at the time, uh, 6.14 PM. Oh, by the way, the purpose of this slide is to demonstrate that there was enough time to transport JFK's body to Bethesda via helicopter by 6.35 PM. It's important to demonstrate that. Uh, that's the arrival time in the Boysian report, but was there enough time to get there? And the answer is yes. So look at the time, 6.14 p.m. That's when LBJ made some brief remarks to the TV audience. The remarks lasted about 45 minutes. He then walked away from the microphone, got on his helicopter called Army One, and the helicopter warmed up. At 6.20 p.m., the helicopter took off, bound for the south grounds of the White House. We know that that helicopter landed at 6.26 p.m. So that was a six minute trip from Andrews to the White House. And I can assure you the pilot was not speeding. 
We had already lost one president that day, and that pilot was not about to lose a second president because he was flying too fast. So that's a six minute trip. Uh, now, what's important to know is that at 621, the television broadcast from Andrews was abruptly terminated. That's one minute after Johnson takes off. The broadcast was terminated and the bright lights were turned out. If we give the people in charge of this transfer, the Secret Service, if we give them two minutes to get JFK's body out of a cargo hold in the airplane into one of the two helicopters earmarked for Bethesda, let's say they left at 6.23 p.m. Uh, Paul O'Connor estimated that at about 6.30, he heard a helicopter land at the Oak Club parking lot uh, next door to Bethesda. Uh, that would give the helicopter seven minutes to make that trip. If we give the helicopter, let's say an additional two minutes until uh, 1832 or 632, that would make this a seven to, nine, seven to nine minute trip, seven to nine minutes to make this trip. That's spot on, that's entirely feasible because Bethesda Naval Hospital is just north of the Washington DC city limits. It's very close to the White House. Washington's not a very big city. Bethesda's just north of downtown Washington. So there were seven to nine minutes allowed for that trip in my timeline in time for the body to be placed in a shipping casket and driven next door to the morgue loading dock by 635. I know you'll want to come back and visit this slide later and study this timeline. So what's the big picture? What does all this mean? What was the goal of the covert operation at Bethesda Naval Hospital? The goal was to remove all evidence of frontal shots from JFK's body before the autopsy of record began. The people doing this had to expand wounds by post-mortem surgery to obtain access to bullets. Their mission was to remove all metal from the body to sanitize the crime scene. To the extent possible, they had to obliterate frontal entry wounds. This was their mission. They had to report only shots from behind during the autopsy record in front of aud the audience, the witnesses in the morgue. They could not report shots from the front. They had to ensure that the official autopsy report written later was consistent with the official cover story. One lone shooter firing from above and behind the president's limousine. Now at the end of this uh, post-mortem surgery, uh, the people doing this had to reintroduce JFK's body into the Dallas casket and reunite the military casket team from Andrews with the Dallas casket before the autopsy of record began, creating the appearance of an unbroken chain of custody. So this is what happened at eight o'clock. JFK's body had been reintroduced into the Dallas casket. The shell game was being played. And as far as uh, the Joint Service casket team knew, the only thing wrong was that they had lost track of where the Dallas casket was for, for many minutes. They did not know that there'd been a shell game going on with the body. They did not know that there were manipulations performed on the body before they found the casket. Okay, continuing right along, slide 25, Dramatis Personae at Bethesda Naval Hospital. These are the major players involved in the drama at Bethesda on November 22nd, 1963. All three pathologists were all military men, 05 in rank. Commander James J. Humes was the chief prosector. He was the director of laboratories at Bethesda. Commander J. Thornton Boswell, his colleague, was also assisting with the autopsy. He was the director of pathology at Bethesda uh, Humes is direct subordinate. Lieutenant Colonel Pierre A. Fink uh, was a Lieutenant Colonel in the Army, and he was the head of the wound ballistics branch at the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology, co-located 
co-located with Walter Reed Medical Center. Now, Dr. Fink, who arrived late at 8.30 p.m. and was only assisting Humes and Boswell, was the only forensic pathologist at the autopsy. Uh, Humes claimed uh, later that he had done one or two autopsies uh, of death by gunshot, but he was not formally trained uh, as a forensic pathologist, neither was Dr. Boswell, and certainly doing one or two autopsies of gunshot by death constitutes no practical training whatsoever, really. Now, the commander of the Bethesda Naval Medical Center uh, was Rear Admiral Calvin B. Galloway. Under Galloway were these two Navy captains, Captain Robert Canada, USN. He was the commanding officer of the Bethesda Treatment Hospital, and Captain John Stover was the commanding officer of the Bethesda Naval Medical School, co-located in the same facility. The president's military physician was Rear Admiral George G. Berkeley, and he was president in the Dallas motorcade. At the back of the motorcade, in a bus where he couldn't see anything, but he was in the Dallas motorcade. Uh, he did arrive later at Parkland Hospital and witnessed part of the uh, attempts to resuscitate the president. And he was present during uh, large portions of the Bethesda autopsy. Also present at the morgue was Navy Surgeon General Vice Admiral George Kenny. Proof of the plot. Now, Navy Corpsman Paul O'Connor heard a helicopter land at the Oak Club parking lot at approximately 6.30 p.m. About five minutes later, he has recalled, agents bringing, uh, he recalls agents bringing a shipping casket into the morgue. In 1977, he told the HSCA that JFK was in a pinkish gray shipping casket, in effect, the wrong casket, and that JFK's body was nude and was encased in a body bag, in effect, the wrong wrappings. Medical procedures were performed between 6.35 and 8 o'clock p.m. that were not witnessed by the large audience at the autopsy of record between 8.15 and 11. Wounds were surgically altered. The throat wound was expanded and cranial surgery was performed. Bullet fragments were removed, some large, some small, which have disappeared. Skull x-rays were taken after the postmortem cranial surgery. Many photographs were taken after the wounds were manipulated, featuring a metal head brace not used during the autopsy of record between eight and 11. Those photos remain in the record today. Skull x-rays and photos in the official record today bear no resemblance whatsoever to the wounds seen in Dallas at Parkland Hospital as you will soon see. JFK's body was reintroduced into the Dallas casket uh, as witnessed by a concerned person, Tom Robinson of Gawler Funeral Home. The Dallas bronze casket was damaged when it was taken out to the loading dock. Uh, three witnesses on the morgue loading dock uh, at uh, eight o'clock at night for the third casket entry saw damage not seen on Air Force One or at Andrews Air Force Base to the casket. Now I call Tom Robinson a concerned uh, witness. Uh, he told the House Select Committee when he was interviewed in 1977 that, quote, the body was taken, dot, 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 and the body never came, dot, 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 end quote. So that statement of his is provocative and it contains ellipses, which probably indicates that there may be something missing from the uh, transcript made by the HSCA staff. The body was taken and the body never came. Well, this is consistent with the body being reintroduced into the Dallas casket. So it could be found by the Joint Service casket team at eight o'clock. Now the military casket team after the ambulance chase, finds the Dallas casket with JFK's body now inside in a light gray Navy ambulance behind the morgue. And they take it into the morgue proper at eight o'clock. When opened in front of a large morgue audience after eight, JFK's body 
I remind you, was wrapped as it had been at Parkland Hospital, with one sheet around the body and another sheet around the head. All the JFK autopsy photos showing the metal head brace, as seen here, were taken between 6.35 and 8 o'clock p.m. How do I know that? I know that because the metal brace was not used during the autopsy of record between 8.15 and 11 o'clock. The use of the head brace, you'll note, conveniently obscures the back of JFK's head. That was very convenient for the people assembling this photographic record. Now, Dr. Humes, the chief prosector, made an excited oral utterance shortly after eight o'clock p.m. Uh, when the head was first unwrapped in front of this large morgue audience of about 35 people. So from the FBI agent's 302 report, uh, they wrote, quote, it was also apparent that a tracheotomy had been performed as well as surgery of the head area, namely in the top of the skull, end quote. Now, the FBI agents made it clear when they were questioned in 1966 by other FBI officials that these were not their judgments. They were quoting what the chief prosector was saying in the morgue, that there had been surgery of the head area. Paul O'Connor, uh, in interviews, uh, public interviews, indicated what probably happened here. Uh, Humes. Uh, was confronted by a disbelieving audience when the head was unwrapped shortly after eight o'clock. Uh, the wound in the top of the head and the right side and the back was absolutely enormous, bigger than anything you could conceive of being made by one bullet. So the audience, uh, according to O'Connor, gasped and began to rumble. Uh, they were very disturbed by what they were looking at. So Humes uh, makes this statement in front of the audience as if to explain what they're looking at, that uh, there's been surgery in the top of the skull. The problem with this is that, of course, we know there was no surgery at Parkland Hospital in Dallas. Now, Agent Seibert confirmed this to the House Committee in 1977, that Humes talked about surgery of the head area. Then the HSCA removed it from his draft affidavit in 1978. Seibert responded by refusing to use the HSCA prepared affidavit, typing his own affidavit and reinserting the statement. I've seen these changes myself. It's really remarkable. Earlier during the 1960s, the FBI agents had confirmed to FBI officials that they had only placed statements in their report that were verbatim remarks made by the chief autopsy pathologist. So my conclusion is that Humes panicked in front of a large aroused uh, morgue audience. They refused to accept that the enormity of the damage in the top of JFK's skull was damage done by a bullet. Of course, there was no cranial surgery performed in Dallas. Humes, in my opinion, was engaging in dissociation by noting publicly what the morgue audience was already disturbed about. By doing so, he was suggesting that obviously he could not have been responsible for what was upsetting the audience. It was obvious after eight o'clock PM that surgery had been performed on JFK's cranium. So Humes was only admitting to the obvious to satisfy the morgue audience in the gallery. This is my interpretation that Humes performed the surgery. Now there's clear evidence of post-mortem surgery uh, in this photo taken between 6.35 and 8 o'clock. We know that's when it was taken because the metal head brace is used. After 8 o'clock, there was no metal head brace used. A, a rubberized uh, chalk was used to rest a head on, not this metal head brace. Note the red incision in the forehead above the right eye and the condition of the top of the head. Both are completely different from what was observed in Dallas at Parkland Hospital. Recall the verbal wound descriptions and the wound diagrams of Nurse Bell and Dr. Crenshaw. They bear no resemblance to this. This is not an acceptable parietal wound. Uh, this wound is in the top of the head, and uh, it's largely in the parietal region and partly in the frontal region.
Now, this is how President Kennedy's appearance was when the body arrived at 6.35 p.m. prior to post-mortem surgery. A new witness surface uh, in 2010 when he contacted me. Uh, his name was Quentin Schwen. Uh, he explained that he had been a photographic student at Rochester Institute of Technology in the early 1980s, where one of his professors, his academic advisor, had previously worked on the House Select Committee on Assassinations, had been one of the two men who analyzed the backyard photographs of Oswald. So his professor knew that Schwinn had an interest in the assassination. And uh, Schwinn later uh, conducted a job interview with a federal official who showed up at RIT and uh, showed him numerous photographs, some of them uh, aerial or satellite photographs of airplanes on the ground, asking Schwinn how he would determine uh, how long the airplanes were, what the wingspan was, how would he use the shadows in the picture. But the agent also showed Schwinn a color positive transparency that looked like this. I spent three years evaluating Schwinn's uh, credibility and I've decided uh, after viewing his uh, sealed uh, transcript, proving that he attended RIT and evaluating uh, other aspects of his story that he is 100% truthful about this. Uh, so I encouraged him to have a medical artist draw a rendition under his supervision of the color positive transparency that he witnessed during this strange uh, job interview in 1981. You'll notice that the top of the head is not gone. Uh, according to Schwinn, there was some slight disruption above Kennedy's right ear. So on the left of this picture, above Kennedy's right ear, you see a dark area. That's where there was some clear disruption right underneath the uh, scalp. And he remembers a small entrance wound high in the forehead above the right eye, which was pink in color. It looked like uh, bubble gum. And uh, in the throat wound was certainly not a gash. It was a uh, two intersecting uh, lines, 90 degrees apart, not very wide at all. Uh, with the corners slightly folded back. This concurs with the recollections of photos seen by Dennis David and Joe O'Donnell. Joe O'Donnell was a USIA White House photographer who was shown images that looked very much like this by White House photographer Robert Knudsen. I write about him in my book about both of them. Uh, Dennis David was shown photographs that looked like this by William Pitzer, the head of the audiovisual department at Bethesda about a week after the assassination. So I showed this image to Dennis David before he died and he confirmed that this looks very much like the photographs he remembers seeing shown to him by Pitzer, almost identical, particularly the top of the head and the small entry wound in the top of the forehead. They look identical with what he recalls seeing in images, images that never made it into the official record. So this is what Kennedy looked like from the front when he arrived from Dallas. Now, look at the image I just showed you on the right, so-called autopsy photograph, which was really taken before eight o'clock, before the autopsy record started. Uh, look at the differences between that image and the medical diagram commissioned by Quentin Schwinn based on his memory of the color positive transparency. The uh, entrance wound high in the forehead above the right eye has been removed, excised with a bright red incision. And the top of the head has been dramatically opened up. The top of the head was not opened up when the body arrived at Bethesda as shown by the diagram on the left but it certainly is in this photograph taken before eight o'clock. Now, this is a wound diagram made for the review board staff by Tom Robinson. Tom Robinson was one of the morticians on the staff of Gawler Funeral Home. Uh, this is further proof that JFK's body arrived at Bethesda with the same head wound seen in Dallas. Tom Robinson drew a sketch very much like this for the House Committee in 1977 
except he drew it freehand on a blank sheet of paper. So we wanted him to draw the wound he recalled seeing when he first saw the president on an anatomical uh, template from Grant's anatomy. So he did that. He drew a hole in the occipital region of the skull. Now his hole is center line. It's not off to the right, but it is in the back of the head. It's not in the top of the head. It's not on the right side of the head. And so this confirms that Kennedy arrived at Bethesda, confirms for me, with the same wound he had when he left Dallas. There were two other people who confirmed this for me. One is Captain Canada, the head of the treatment hospital, who told researcher Michael Kurtz in 1968 that President Kennedy had an avulsed, exploded uh, exit wound in the rear of his head. Uh, and when he was challenged about this by uh, researcher Kurtz, that this was at variance with the autopsy report, Captain Canada told him at the time, well, of course, that's part of the cover-up, and I don't want you to publish this recollection of mine until 25 years after my death. So fortunately, uh, Michael Kurtz did publish this recollection of Dr. Canada, which confirms this drawing. He published it in 2006 in his book, The Assassination Debates. And then Dr. Ebersol, the radiologist at the autopsy, uh, testified to the House Select Committee that President Kennedy had a large occipital wound in the back of his head, and that later uh, a piece of bone produced at the autopsy was from the occipital region of the skull. Now, we asked Tom Robinson in regard to this drawing, what are the dotted lines in the picture? He said they indicated saw cuts, post-mortem surgery to remove JFK's brain. So in his 1977 HSCA interview, Robinson made clear that he witnessed the pathologist saw the skull open and remove JFK's brain. A Robinson's drawing at the right for the review board indicates where the saw cuts were made. I call this a modified craniotomy. It's not the normal way a craniotomy, a skull cap removal is performed, but it was sufficient to get access to the brain. Witnesses at the autopsy proper between eight and 11 did not see Humes perform a craniotomy and Humes denied doing so to the Warren Commission. And yet he told the ARRB under oath that he did, very matter of factly told us that he did perform a craniotomy. But nobody saw a craniotomy performed between eight and 11 o'clock when the autopsy proper was performed. So that tells me that Tom Robinson was witnessing post-mortem surgery between 6.35 and eight o'clock. When Tom Robinson looked at this autopsy photograph, he frowned and became extremely disturbed. And in his own way, he's a country boy from Maryland. He said, well, that's, that makes it look like that's what the bullet did. And he shook his head left, right, and he said, that's what the doctors did, not what the bullet did. So I'm going to repeat what he told us in 1996. That's what the doctors did, not what the bullet did. So this is Tom Robinson confirming postmortem surgery with his ARRB interview, just as he did with his diagram. There are two direct witnesses to postmortem surgery at Bethesda Naval Hospital. One is the aforementioned mortician, Tom Robinson. He saw JFK's skull sawed open to remove the brain prior to eight o'clock. He saw the brain surgically removed by the pathologist. We'll be talking about that in a minute. And these are the sources, HSCA, ARRB. Another witness to postmortem surgery was X-ray technician, Ed Reed. There were two enlisted men who took the skull x-rays and the other x-rays, Ed Reed and his supervisor, Gerald Custer. Reed told us under oath in 1997 that he witnessed Dr. Humes cut the scalp high in the frontal bone, way up high above your forehead, just above the hairline with a horizontal scalpel cut. So in this image, that scalpel cut would be left to right after the hair begins. He then saw the scalp retracted 
from front to back, and he witnessed Dr. Humes cut into the underlying cranial bone with a mechanical circular bone saw. At that point, he and Custer were summarily dismissed. Get the hell out of here. What are you doing in the morgue? Get out of here. Uh, if you analyze their testimony, it's clear that they were recalled a short time later, 15 to 20 to 30 minutes later, uh, and then they took the skull x-rays after this manipulation was performed. So these, lex these next four slides are extremely important. They are a bit busy. Don't panic. I'm gonna walk you through these slides. They're extremely important to this presentation. Uh, JFK's brain was removed during postmortem surgery to sanitize the crime scene by removing all visible metal from the brain and bullet tracks in the brain tissue. Uh, so look, uh, you need to understand that there were two Navy corpsmen who assisted the three pathologists with the autopsy, James Jenkins and Paul O'Connor. They were crucial witnesses who help us understand what took place prior to eight o'clock PM at Bethesda Naval Hospital by describing what they saw after eight o'clock. What they saw and did not see after eight o'clock is vital to understanding the flow of events that evening. So bear with me and let's walk through this one step at a time. Now, Navy Corpsman James Jenkins, after eight o'clock PM, witnessed Dr. Humes publicly remove the brain before a large Bethesda morgue audience. And uh, these, uh, Recollections of his all come from two late night appearances he made in Dallas in 2013 on the 50th anniversary from meticulous notes taken by Dr. David Mantic. I trust Dr. Mantic implicitly to take accurate notes. So uh, let's just start here. No craniotomy, no skull cap removal was performed between eight and 11. Neither James Jenkins nor Paul O'Connor witnessed the craniotomy at the autopsy proper. But Tom Robinson and Ed Reed did prior to eight o'clock during clandestine surgery. I just told you about that. They both saw extensive cutting on the calvarium. And while it was not a traditional skull cap removal, it was sufficient to provide access to the brain. While Reed was summarily ordered to leave the morgue after Humes commenced the postmortem surgery, Robinson, who was a mere mortician and therefore a non-entity as far as Humes was concerned, he was allowed to stay and actually witnessed the brain removed as well. Jenkins has opined that there was much more damage to the scalp and skull than the damage to the brain would have suggested. Much more damage to the scalp and skull than the damage to the brain would have suggested. Well, this damage is the postmortem surgery. Let's continue. James Jenkins, after 8 o'clock p.m., witnessed Dr. Humes publicly remove JFK's brain before a large Bethesda morgue audience. James Jenkins clearly recalls Dr. Humes' excited oral utterance. Quote, this brain has fallen out in my hands, end quote. James Jenkins concluded in 2013 at a Dallas symposium that no cutting was required to remove JFK's brain because it had been previously removed from JFK's cranium. He speculated that the purpose for doing this would have been to remove bullet fragments. JFK's brain appeared to Jenkins to be too small for his cranium. My conclusion is that this was likely due to extreme dehydration. After all, it was seven and a half hours after death, plus extensive tissue loss both from bullets and from postmortem surgery. A Jenkins firm opinion in 2013 was that the brain removed from JFK's cranium did not match the HSCA drawing of a brain photo in the National Archives. More on this later. James Jenkins told Dr. David Mantic and Dr. Gary Aguilar in 2013 that the brain he saw removed at the autopsy had much more extensive tissue loss in the posterior region of the brain, in the back of the brain, than in the HSEA drawing made from a brain photograph in the archives. We'll be looking at this HSEA drawing later in this presentation. 
once again. He examined the drawing made from a brain photograph in the archives. He said it did not match the brain removed from JFK's cranium and handed to him by Dr. Humes to infuse. James Jenkins re received and infused JFK's brain in the morgue after he witnessed its public removal by Dr. Humes after eight o'clock PM. The preservation technique using 10% formalin solution or formaldehyde was called perfusion by former AFIP neuropathologist, Dr. Dick Davis. I interviewed Dr. Dick Davis in 1997. This technique involved both injection drip or infusion and soaking afterwards while fully immersed. That's called exfusion. Jenkins noticed that the internal carotid arteries in the brain's underside were severely shriveled and retracted and thus difficult to infuse, unlike the condition of most recently removed brains. The brain stem had already been cut when Dr. Humes removed the brain in two different planes on each side of the brain stem when Humes removed it and relinquished it to Jenkins. This explains how he could witness Humes remove the brain without doing any cutting to free it. It is worth repeating here that Jenkins expressed the definite conclusion in 2013 during the JFK conference at the Adolphus Hotel in Dallas that the brain Humes extracted from JFK's cranium in front of Jenkins and a large morgue audience had already been removed previously, probably in order to remove bullet fragments. Now here's the last of these four busy slides. Let's conclude by making some important points. The three existing JFK skull x-rays show that JFK's brain was definitely still in the cranium when the skull x-rays were taken, but that there was considerable tissue loss from the forebrain, both the left and right of the forebrain, and from the right cerebral hemisphere. This is confirmed by optical density measurements, which Dr. Magic will talk about in two weeks, and by visual observation using a hot light by qualified medical personnel who have examined the skull x-rays in the archives. So my conclusion is that much of this tissue loss in the forebrain and on the right side of the brain was the result of clandestine post-mortem surgery between 6.35 p.m. and 8 o'clock p.m., not bullet blast. Certainly some was the result of bullet blast, but most of it is the result of surgery to remove metal from the brain and bullet tracks from brain tissue. Now, Navy Corpsman Paul O'Connor's oft-repeated assertion, timed to eight o'clock in his memory, that, quote, there was no brain in the cranium, end quote, was likely a hastily made subjective interpretation error based on the large amount of brain tissue missing from the forebrain and the right cerebral hemisphere. After all, there was a brain in the cranium. Jenkins received it from Dr. Humes and infused it that night. So O'Connor simply made a mistake a subjective interpretation error uh, based on uh, the first dramatic sight he had when the scalp flaps were retracted and he saw that there was a lot of brain tissue missing inside the cranium. It's clearly just an exaggeration on his part. My conclusion is that neither Jenkins nor O'Connor was present in the morgue during the clandestine postmortem surgery conducted well before eight o'clock p.m. to sanitize the crime scene. Neither man witnessed or conducted a craniotomy, whereas it was normally their job to do so at Bethesda autopsies. Paul O'Connor was certainly present when the shipping casket arrived earlier, but he told the HSCA that he was ordered out of the morgue for up to 40 minutes at one point. Per Tom Robinson and Ed Reed, Dr. Humes did perform a modified craniotomy of sorts, but since neither Jenkins nor O'Connor recalled that, I conclude that they were not present in the morgue during most of the period between 6.35 and 8. They witnessed only what the large morgue audience witnessed after 8 o'clock. The one exception was Paul O'Connor, who did witness the early arrival of the shipping cask and the removal and opening of the body bag found inside the shipping cask before he was dismissed from the morgue and placed under guard by a member of the Marine security detail. Okay, we're continuing here with uh, 
part four and slide 40. Now this autopsy photograph shows more evidence of post-mortem surgery. JFK's tracheotomy had been expanded to more than twice its original width at Parkland Hospital. The clear intent was to obliterate the entry wound and make it mimic an exit wound. Dr. Charles Crenshaw, in a nationally televised interview on ABC TV in 1992, stated that uh, the trach wound in this photograph was at least double, double the width that he observed at Parkland Hospital after the president's death, when the wound had closed of its own volition and when it was much smaller. So let's examine the, what the record says about the increasing size of the tracheotomy incision. At Parkland Hospital, uh, per Dr. Perry and Dr. Carrico, uh, the length of the lateral incision made by Dr. Perry was two and a half to three centimeters. Two and a half to three centimeters. The autopsy report states that this uh, trach wound was 6.5 centimeters wide and it had widely gaping irregular edges. In his Warren Commission testimony, Dr. Humes uh, said that the wound was seven to eight centimeters wide. So it just keeps expanding. And as I mentioned previously, Dr. Crenshaw on national TV said in 1992 that it was at least double its original width that it had been tampered with. Some of the enlisted men at the autopsy called this a gash. It was so dramatic. And uh, Tom Robinson from the funeral home said to the House Committee that it was nasty looking. So this wasn't like any tray concision that either Tom Robinson or Paul O'Connor or James Jenkins had ever seen. Now this autopsy photograph represents not postmortem surgery, but likely photographic alteration, most likely. It was impugned by FBI agents Seibert and O'Neill under oath before the ARRB and by Dr. Ebersol under oath before the HSCA. You'll notice that this bears no resemblance to the wound diagrams drawn by nurse Audrey Bell or Dr. Charles Crenshaw, nor is it consistent with the wound descriptions in the doctor's treatment notes from Dallas, describing it as occipital parietal or occipital temporal. Here's a close up of it. Uh, in verbatim comments under oath by FBI agents Seibert and O'Neill and by Dr. Ebersol, this photograph was impugned and disowned. So Seibert to the review board in 1997, quote, well, I don't have a recollection of it being that intact. I don't recall anything like this at all during the autopsy. It looks like it could have been reconstructed or something, end quote. Frank O'Neill to the review board in 1997, quote, this looks like it's been doctored in some way, like the stuff has been pushed back in and it looks more like towards the end than the beginning of the autopsy. Quite frankly, I thought there was a larger opening in the back of the head, end quote. And then Dr. Ebersol uh, to the House Select Committee under oath in 1978, as he was examining this photograph, he said, quote, that JFK had, quote, more of a gaping occipital wound than this, and that the autopsy photos depict a head wound, quote, more superior and lateral, end quote, than what he remembered on the body. Ebersol testified, quote, the back of the head was missing. Later in the evening, a large fragment of occipital bone was retrieved from Dallas, end quote. So once again, Ebersol said that the wounds shown in this photograph are more superior and lateral than what he remembered. It appears as if the two gloved hands uh, by a pathologist are pulling up scalp uh, from inside the empty cranium. And uh, by the way, uh, President Kennedy was lying on his left shoulder when this was taken. I've uh, changed the orientation to make it easier to view, but he was lying on his left shoulder. 
So my first guess when I looked at these images was that someone had radically rearranged the scalp from the left side of the head by, by pulling it over to the middle and the right to cover up the big exit defect in the right rear of the skull. That it was a reorientation of scalp for the simple purpose of a deceiving photograph. But Dr. Mantic has reviewed the back of the head photos stereoscopically. And he says that uh, these are the only photos that don't look right under stereoscopic vision. When he looks at two very similar views, the center of the head in this image, the part that looks wet, where the hair looks wet, looks two-dimensional. And the rest of the photo looks three-dimensional. So he concludes that this is a photographic alteration. And uh, you know we don't know yet. Uh, it's a matter of debate. But all I can tell you is that this is not an honest photograph of the way President Kennedy looked inside the Bethesda morgue. One way or the other, it's a dishonest image. Now, in contrast, former FBI agent James Seibert drew this JFK wound diagram for the review board in his 1997 deposition. It's consistent with the Parkland wound diagrams made for us by Nurse Bell and Dr. Crenshaw. And it's consistent with the wound descriptions of the Dallas doctors in their 1963 treatment notes and their 1964 testimony. So the first attempt uh, Seibert made was the solid line in the diagram. Then he reconsidered and said, I didn't make it big enough. So he drew a dotted line around the solid line. That's his second attempt. He says he thinks the wound was a little bit larger than he first drew it. it. So the dotted line is the one he stands behind as of 1997. It's consistent with the Tom Robinson wound diagrams made in 1997 for the review for the uh, HSCA and in 1996 for the review board except that Robinson's was more center line, but they were both in the back of the head. That's the important thing here. Now this is consistent with another ARRB witness, Sandra Spencer, a photographer's made in the Navy, who developed a whole series of photographs of JFK uh, that are not in the official collection today. We don't know where they are. We don't know what happened to them. Her photographs from her testimony appear to have been taken probably after embalming was completed because the president was all cleaned up and there wasn't any blood visible. And uh, she remembers uh, developing a photo with a hole in the back of the head. It was a little smaller than this. And uh, I conclude that she was looking at a photograph taken after the embalming and the restoration of the president's body was completed. But anyway, the photograph she developed that weekend are no longer uh, available. They're not in any official collection. So this drawing by Seibert is consistent with the descriptions of the JFK exit wound as being the size of a small orange or the size of a baseball or as the size of a human fist. James Jenkins also described it as the size of a silver dollar. So uh, that's smaller than, that's a little smaller than an orange or a baseball, but they're the same order of magnitude or approximation. Now, one might wonder how can the FBI agents make sketches, which they've both done, of, of this Dallas wound if all of the postmortem surgery had been completed on the cranium? And the answer was provided during his testimony by Dr. Boswell. We'll talk about Boswell in just a moment. Dr. Boswell told us that all the bone was missing on the top of the head in the right rear of the head and the right side of the head. It was all missing, but that when the scalp flaps were closed, you couldn't see inside the large cavity. You couldn't see the large cavity. So that can explain how the FBI agents could see President Kennedy's wound that looked somewhat like this when they first saw the head after eight o'clock PM because the scalp flaps had not been retracted yet to show the enormity of the defect caused by post-mortem surgery. So let's talk about a big lie told by the House Select Committee on Assassinations about the autopsy photos. Uh, the HSCA wrote in volume seven, in disagreement with the observations of the Parkland doctors are the 26 people present at the autopsy. All of those interviewed who attended the autopsy corroborated the general location of the wounds as depicted in the photographs. 
none had differing accounts, unquote. That's a very strong statement. All of those interviewed and none had differing accounts than what we see in the photos. Now the HSCA sealed Dr. Ebersole's deposition about an occipital wound in JFK said, and most of its medical witness interview reports for 50 years. They were not to have been released until 2029, but because of the JFK Records Act passed in 1992, uh, their release was mandated. So in 1993, the Ebersole deposition and all the staff interview reports of witnesses were released. And the result is that 12 autopsy witnesses that I'm aware of interviewed by the HSCA staff contradicted the big lie in volume seven of its report, which I quoted above. These 12 witnesses contradicted the big lie by recalling serious damage to the rear of President Kennedy's head. And in my book, I list the names of the 12 people and the document numbers of their interview reports. The person that first brought this lie to my attention was uh, Dr. Gary Aguilar. So I wanna commend him for uh, making this public back in uh, circa 1994 or so in a public lecture. Now, here's one more big lie by the HSA, HSCA that's been exposed. They re-described this photo ignoring the description provided by the autopsy pathologists. I'll just talk about it. You can go back and study this slide later if you'd like. The autopsy pathologists, two of them, Humes and Boswell and Dr. Ebersole and photographer John Stringer made a catalog, a description and a listing by number of the autopsy photographs and x-rays in November of 1966. They made a catalog. They described this as the posterior skull, the back of the head. Paul O'Connor later confirmed this when he looked at the bootleg autopsy photos and he said, oh yeah, all that area of missing bone, that's, that's the right rear of the head. He said, that's the posterior skull, it's the back of the head and all the area of missing bone in the upper right of the photo is in the right rear of the head. That's Paul O'Connor. He was there, he was in the room. But the House Select Committee on Assassinations Forensic Pathology Panel Redescribe this photo as the right front of the head. And they want this semicircular notch, which you see in the center of the image, to be uh, an exit wound in the upper right front of the head. And they would have you believe that the president is lying on his face uh, and, uh, and that you're looking at his forehead and the, and, the, and the forward part of the frontal bone and part of the right parietal bone. But they redescribed the photo without telling you that what they were doing. They never told you anywhere in their report in 1979 that they were at variance, at odds with the way the doctors who are at the autopsy described this photograph. So this is intellectual dishonesty. And uh, in doing so, they were mimicking what the Justice Department said in the so-called military review report, January 67, uh, and going along with that. Because remember, they wanted to, to believe that the back of the head was intact and that all the Dallas doctors were wrong. So the House Select Committee not only disagreed with the autopsy physicians on what this portrayed, but they were dishonest about it and didn't tell their readers that they had uh, re-described it and uh, not gone along with the original description that this was the back of the head. Now, this is a famous sketch made by Dr. Boswell, who was assisting Dr. Humes at the autopsy, a sketch he made on the back of the autopsy descriptive sheet. On the other side of this sheet were two body charts and uh, places to write the weights of various organs. He drew this freehand sketch on the back of the autopsy descriptive sheet, which uh, describes the amount of bone missing from the top of President Kennedy's cranium. And you can see in the drawing that he, he wrote 10 by 17 missing. He told the House Select Committee Forensic Pathology Panel in 1977 that this area inside the dotted lines in the top of the president's head was all missing bone. Missing bone. That certainly doesn't equate with anything anyone saw in Dallas at Parkland Hospital. 
So my conclusion, as I say on the left, is that Boswell and Humes are depicting the results of their own postmortem surgery to gain access to the brain as damage done by the assassin's bullet. Uh, Dr. Humes burned all of the other autopsy notes, but not this diagram. It's blood spattered, covered with blood. And he could not explain why this one page wasn't burned in his fireplace and was retained when asked by the review board under oath. I believe this diagram is a con job uh, representing the extensive damage from post-mortem mortem surgery as damage caused by a bullet and not as a modified craniotomy used to sanitize a crime scene. This depicts the true extent of the surgery to the head area admitted to by a panicked Dr. Humes and recorded by the two FBI agents in their report. Now we asked Dr. Boswell to take a human skull model and mark on the skull model, the entire area of missing bone, <coughs> excuse me. He did so uh, and uh, I rendered his three-dimensional drawing on a skull model in four drawings. So uh, notice the outline on the left. This is how much bone Dr. Boswell said was entirely missing from the skull of President Kennedy. Unbelievable. And then uh, from the right side, you could see it starts in the frontal bone. It goes through the right parietal and extends back into the occipital region. You also see a dotted line on the left in the top of the cranium. That dotted line, according to Boswell, was a long laceration, a scalp tear. I believe it was an incision made by Humes, but he called it a laceration. Let's look at the next two drawings. There's a frontal version of what he drew on the skull model. And then there's the, the top version. Now you can examine this skull model with his markings on it in the National Archives if you make an appointment. These are remarkable in that they are so different from what was observed in Parkland Hospital. This is not just one of those things that people can't explain. This is evidence of post-mortem surgery to remove the president's brain and remove bullet fragments from his brain. Now let's look at this photograph one more time. The skull model on the right, on the extreme right, uh, shows in dark red, the approximate size and location of the original exit wound seen in Dallas. The pink area, it shows how it was expanded. This original exit wound was expanded by post-mortem surgery prior to eight o'clock on November 22nd, to gain access to the brain, in fact, to remove the brain and remove bullet fragments from the brain, after which the brain was put back in the cranium, the scalp, scalp flaps were closed, President Kennedy's head was wrapped again, he was placed back in the Dallas casket, and his body was allowed to be found by the Joint Service casket team and brought in again at eight o'clock. Now, I want to say a word about David Lifton. I still think his book, Best Evidence, is the best work anybody's ever done on the three casket entries. And what happened at Love Field with the casket. And he also created a paradigm shift for us, such that we should uh, stop focusing entirely on the single bullet theory, which you'll notice I haven't covered tonight, and focus instead on the differences in the head wounds between what was seen at Parkland and what's seen by witnesses at Bethesda Naval Hospital and in many of the autopsy photos. So we're, he's responsible for the valuable paradigm shift and what we focus on and in the uh, good work he did on the three casket entries. I disagree with David Lifton on two major points. Uh, in his book, he believed that President Kennedy's brain was removed from his cranium before the body arrived at Bethesda. I say again, before the body arrived at Bethesda. The evidence that we know today just doesn't support that, and I've already covered that evidence. Uh, he also believed that the wound alterations took place before the body arrived at Bethesda. I don't believe that either. The timeline doesn't support that, and the evidence as I understand it, and as we know today, does not support that. So. Uh, he did, I think, the best he could with a lot of the conflicts in the medical evidence based on what he could find out by uh, 1980, 
His book was published early in 81. But the review board has expanded what we know, partly because of the JFK Record Act releasing HSCA records, and partly because of uh, new researcher interviews, and partly because, uh, well, from sworn testimony. Okay, this is uh, part five, the last part of my presentation. It starts with an overview of JFK's skull x-rays. For those of you who are still hanging with me, uh, congratulations. For those of you who are hanging with me and maybe a little bit overwhelmed right now with uh, new data, uh, I ask you to uh, go get a cup of coffee or a Pepsi and uh, refresh yourself because this is the most important part of my presentation coming up. After I talk about the skull x-rays, I'll be talking about the two brain exams that occurred after the autopsy on JFK's body. And that is the most important evidence there is about a medical cover-up. So we'll launch into that shortly. First, uh, I wanna give you a very brief overview of JFK's skull x-rays. And it's going to be brief, and I'm gonna go through this quickly because during the next two weeks, uh, you're gonna hear from Dr. Mike Chesser and Dr. David Mantic, who are gonna be talk talking extensively, <coughs> excuse me, They'll both be talking extensively about the JFK skull x-rays. So I'm just going to give you an introductory primer, as it were, to some of the key aspects of their work. I hope I don't get anything wrong. If I do, they'll get a chance to correct or clarify that in the next two weeks. So there were a total of either five or six skull x-rays taken per uh, John Ebersol, a radiologist, and Gerald Custer, the lead x-ray technician. Ebersol told David Magic that there were six. A Custer, uh, at different times, said there were five, and at different times, he said there were six. He was a little unclear in his memory, either five or six. Ebersol said six. Only three skull x-rays are now in the official collection at the National Archives. Only three skull x-rays were ever placed in the official collection at the National Archives. All of the skull x-rays were exposed after the post-mortem surgery to JFK's cranium. Dr. David Mantic has revealed through his optical densitometry studies in his nine visits to the National Archives that all three extant skull x-rays are not originals, but instead are altered copy films. Now, both lateral x-rays, the left and the right, are whited out in the right rear, hiding severe soft tissue and bone loss in the right rear of the head. The AP skull x-ray, which is the front to back view, has had the image of a 6.5 millimeter supposed bullet fragment added to the image to incriminate the accused assassin. This is the HSCA's uh, enhanced image of the AP skull x-ray, anterior, posterior skull x-ray. Note the apparent bullet fragment. Now, I'm going to move my cursor over here and circle this. This is the brightest object on the x-ray by far. And it's as bright as uh, metal would be in normal circumstances. You're looking at it through the right orbit, the orbit of the right eye, but it's not in the right eye. It's supposed to be on the back of the skull. So you're looking from front to rear, and this is supposed to be on the back of the skull. This bright object was not seen by any of the three pathologists on the x-ray at the autopsy, per their review board depositions. This is the brightest object on the skull x-ray. It was not found on the body and not removed at the autopsy. It simply was not there. Now, the purpose of x-rays at an autopsy is to find bullets in the body if you have a death by gunshot wound. So why wasn't this seen on the x-ray at the autopsy? The conclusion is that it is a photographic artifact, a forgery, a visual special effect created after the fact. By light blasting, uh, the original and creating a copy film image with this light blasting imprinted on the copy film. 
Now here is the HSCA uh, enhanced image of the right lateral X-ray, which they published. The right rear of the skull shows a bright white area, a white patch, which if, if this were an authentic X-ray, the optical density readings of the bright, the extreme brightness of this white patch, I'm gonna move my cursor. This is the white patch I'm talking about right here, which equates to the right rear of the skull, just behind the ear. The optical density of this white patch says that if this was a true X-ray and a true reading, uh, this would literally be what David Manty calls a bonehead skull. This, the skull bone here would have to be about 500 times more dense than a normal skull is in this area. That's how bright the object is. Now this white patch, uh, Mantic concludes, is a photographic alteration, a visual special effect imposed after the fact. And once again, it's created by light blasting. Uh, uh, you make a template, you light blast, this one specific area through the original film onto a copy film. And then it's recorded on the copy film and passed off as an original when it really isn't. Now also note the missing brain tissue in the top of the skull. This is the result of post-mortem surgery. All those dark areas in the forebrain and on the uh, right side of the skull indicate uh, missing brain tissue. The fragment trail in the upper cranium begins with the entry wound above the right eye and goes upward. Now this entry wound was recently discovered by Dr. Michael Chesser, a neurologist during his visits to the archives. And he'll be talking about this next week. Uh, I'm gonna use my cursor again. He discovered an entry wound in the frontal bone right about here, right above this bump, right here. And he'll explain this next week. And you notice this lines up with the fragment trail that goes from front to back. We know the fragment trail goes from front to back because the largest fragments are in the back. They travel the farthest because they have the most mass. Now, I should add here that uh, Dr. Humes in the autopsy report falsely stated that there was a fragment trail on this X-ray going from the entry wound low in the back of the head toward the general area of exit, which he claimed was up here. So Dr. Humes claimed. So his fragment trail, as he wrote it in the autopsy report, goes from down here up here. And as you can see, there is no such fragment trail. This is another example of either a very poor memory by Dr. Humes at the time he was writing the autopsy report, which I sincerely doubt, or it's an example of perjury. And I, I think it's an example of perjury. Uh, he was questioned about this by the review board and uh, looked uh, very sheepish, very embarrassed. His face turned pink and he had no explanation for how he could get something that wrong. Now, uh, here's the same right lateral x-ray, which you see on the left here that I just showed you, compared to a sketch Dr. Mantic made of the same image, where he has circled the white patch, the altered area of the image, uh, and put a P there. P means posterior, posterior skull uh, that's unusually bright, much brighter than any normal skull is in this area. The F means the frontal area, and that's unusually dark. And that's because there's so much missing brain tissue. The forebrain is gone and much of the right cerebral hemisphere is gone. He will talk more about this in two weeks. Now there's a new consensus I'd like to talk about. It's a consensus arrived at by Dr. Mantic and I over the last several years. And that is that there are three shots to JFK's head, which you can find evidence for in the medical evidence. Uh, this is a rather busy slide I'm gonna let you come back and re-examine this after you, uh, uh, after you have a chance to view this presentation online. But I'm gonna cover the highlights here right now. I'm gonna discuss the three entry points. If you look at number one here in the green, the entry wound 
low in the right rear of the skull is something that all three pathologists agreed on. Uh, it, they agreed on very few things, but that's the one thing they did agree on, that the entry wound in the back of the head was very low in the rear of the skull, slightly above the EOP, the external occipital protuberance, and about 2.5 centimeters to the right of that, about one inch to the right, slightly above the EOP. I don't think this bullet which entered here exited the skull. I think it hit the orbit of the right eye. That's why the orbit of the right eye is cracked. The right eye is uh, dislocated and, uh, and uh, was divergent from the left eye. Uh, so uh, it, the right eye was displaced and the bone behind it is fractured. So anyway, that's entry wound number one. Entry wound number two is the entry wound high above the right eye, which I discussed previously, high in the forehead, just above the right eye and just below the hairline. Uh, Dr. Chesser will describe this next week and how he discovered this in the National Archives. Uh, the fragment trail seen so visibly in, this, uh, in these lateral x-rays, both the right and the left lateral, uh, begins at the point where he found this entry wound. And then it proceeds upward. Entry wound number three, which Mantic and I agree on is in the right temple, in the actual temporal bone, very close to the right ear, slightly above and forward of the right ear, hidden in the hair, inside the hairline. Now, Dr. Chesser will discuss next week how he discovered definite evidence of, of a bullet hole in the right temple in both the lateral x-rays and the AP x-ray. He's got many images to show you, uh, which which I don't have, and he'll do a great job explaining it. Uh, he's about 80% sure, I think, 85% sure that it's an entry wound. He's not totally sure, but he thinks it's probably an entry wound. And uh, Mantic and I consider this the third entry wound in the head. So uh, by the way, this entry wound in the right temple, this number three here on this slide, would be the one that caused the massive blowout seen at Parkland Hospital, the massive blowout in the right rear of the skull would have been caused by the bullet that entered in the right temple. That's how Mantic and I see it. So uh, I invite you to come back and revisit this slide later. We have to keep moving and I have to keep accelerating here so that I don't run out of time. Now, this is what I call the most important evidence of a medical cover-up in the JFK assassination. The two brain exams that occurred after JFK's autopsy. Uh, you can read all about this in chapter 10 of my book. That's all chapter 10 is about. Uh, it's the best part of my book. So uh, what happens to a brain that's uh, injured by gunshot and a death by gunshot wound? The brain is preserved in formalin solution, that's diluted formaldehyde, and normally is examined one to two weeks after the autopsy on a body. Under normal circumstances, the brain can only be examined once since it is destroyed by cutting serial sectioning during the examination. In a case of death by gunshot wound to the head, the brain should provide a diagram of the shooting and should reveal how many shots there were, their entry and exit points, and the bullet tracks in the brain should be revealed by the serial section, sectioning, otherwise known as the bread loaf type incisions. But rigorous timeline evidence that I compiled reveals that there were actually two brain exams after the autopsy on JFK's body on November 22, 1963. JFK's brain was examined on Monday morning, November 25, 1963, and the photos taken were never placed in the official record. A substitute brain, someone else's brain, obviously, was examined between November 29 and December 2, 1963. And these photos of a brain are in the official record today, but they cannot be JFK's brain. Once again, the photos of a brain in the official record today, there are 14 of them, cannot be JFK's brain. And the next several slides will explain why to you so that there's no doubt in your mind whatsoever. Now, my boss, Jeremy Gunn, the general counsel, requested that I study everything anybody had ever said that was recorded about the brain exam. And when I did so, it revealed that there were two separate events 
at two points in time, about a week apart, more or less a week apart. And I, I was startled by this. And so let's go ahead and look at the evidence for the two brain exams. Now, JFK's brain exam on November 25th was his brain. The photos have disappeared. They're not in the official collection. Navy civilian photographer John Stringer and Navy pathologist J. Thornton Boswell told both the HSCA and the ARRB that the exam was on Monday, November 25th. This was possible only two and a half days after the autopsy because JFK's brain was preserved with a double technique called perfusion. I discussed that with you earlier. It's a combination of soaking or exfusion and injection drip, which is infusion, thus ensuring that the brain, brain was firm enough to dissect even just two and a half days after the autopsy on the body. Now, Bethesda specialist Leland Benson told the HSCA staff that he processed President Kennedy's brain tissue on Monday, November 25th. And he created uh, tissue blocks and slides from the tissue that was given to him. That these were some of the, this was one of the records that the HSCA tried to suppress for 50 years. It was released in 1993, thanks to the JFK Records Act. Now, doctors Humes and Boswell and Stringer were present at this first brain exam. Humes, Boswell, and Stringer. Dr. Fink was not present, per Boswell and Stringer. In fact, Stringer told me after his autopsy, excuse me, Stringer told me after his uh, deposition was concluded that he thought the reason Fink was not invited to the brain exam that he photographed was because Fink caused, quote, too much trouble at the autopsy, unquote. It's a very interesting comment. JFK's brain was indeed serially sectioned with bread loaf type incisions. Each section was placed on a light box and photographed with illumination from above and below, photographed by John Stringer. Prior to sectioning, the intact brain was only photographed from above, not from below which means there would be no basilar views, only superior views. Now, Stringer used Kodak Ektachrome E3 color transparency film and Kodak portrait pan black and white negative film to take his brain photographs. Both of these were in duplex holders. They were both four by five inches in size per his review board testimony. The second brain exam of the substitute brain was conducted between November 29th and December 2nd. Here's how we know those dates. Army pathologist, Dr. Pierre Fink wrote in his February 1965 report to his commanding officer, Army General Bloomberg, that Dr. Humes called him on November 29th and ordered him to participate in the brain examination. Fink testified to the review board that the brain exam was, quote, one or two weeks after the autopsy, end quote. Now, Chief Petty Officer Chester Boyers, a Navy corpsman, told the House Select Committee that he processed JFK's brain tissue on December 2nd, 1963. He made six blocks from eight or 12 sections of the brain. There are two different uh, interview reports or call reports of their discussions with him in the record, which were released in 1993, along with the other interview reports that were going to be suppressed for 50 years. Now, he took contemporaneous notes that, that day, he told the HSCA, but he did not witness the event itself. That's the day he processed the brain tissue, which he was told was President Kennedy's brain tissue. So that exam had to be between November 29th and December 2nd inclusive. The attendees at the second brain exam were Dr. Humes, Dr. Boswell, Dr. Fink, and an unknown Navy photographer. Per Fink's notes to General Bloomberg in 1965, this brain was not serially sectioned. No bread loaf incisions were made so as to, quote, preserve the specimen, end quote. Uh, this was recorded by Dr. Fink in his notes. This was totally contrary to any normal procedure in regard to gunshot wounds to the brain. It was not serially sectioned per all three pathologists, Dr. Fink, Dr. Humes, and Dr. Boswell. 
Now, Fink wrote in February 1965 that the brain looked different than it did at the autopsy on the body after it had been removed from the cranium. He, he ascribed this to fixation artifacts. Uh, it's important enough that he put this in his notes to General Bloomberg in late 1965. And it looks quite peculiar now. It looks like Fink is raising a red flag in the record that there was something wrong with the brain that the brain exam. It didn't look like the one that he saw removed, that he saw, well, actually he didn't see it removed. He arrived after the brain was removed. He arrived at 8.30 PM and he saw this brain uh, uh, being infused in a, in a bucket of formaldehyde at the morgue, but it looked different than that brain that he saw that night. Photographs of this brain were placed in the official record and reside in the National Archives today. Now the HSCA wrote that the brain in the photographs could not be authenticated as the brain of John F. Kennedy. This is not the same as saying they thought it wasn't his brain, but all this meant was that they could not authenticate that it was his brain. There was no way to authenticate this brain as belonging to any particular person. I'm telling you that it was not President Kennedy's brain. I'm absolutely certain of that. Now, per renowned forensic pathologist, Dr. Robert Kirshner, an ARRB consultant, the brain photos in the National Archives depict a brain that had been, quote, very well fixed, end quote, in formalin for about two or three weeks. He's one of the three consultants we had examined the autopsy materials just for the benefit of our staff, of me and Jeremy Gunn and David Marwell, our executive director. The implication of his observation is that the photos of a brain in the official collection cannot possibly depict JFK's brain, which was examined less than three days after it was removed from his body at autopsy. Now this brain that uh, Dr. Kirshner is referring to as very well fixed for two or three weeks is very gray in color. It actually has a rubbery looking texture in the photographs and it's not pink at all. Uh, there's no uh, residue of blood in the tissue. Now there are serious problems with the brain photographs in the archives. I'm gonna run through these quickly because they're very easy to understand. There are no photographs of serial sections present, only photos of a damaged but intact brain. But Stringer photographed many serial sections on top of a light box, illuminated from above and below. Half of the photos are superior views and half of them are basilar views taken from the underside. But Stringer did not take basilar views. That was his testimony under oath and he did not change his testimony even after he saw these images. The color transparencies do not show the Kodak label and do not have the correct film notches in the corner that E3 film should have. But Stringer used Kodak ectochrome E3 film at the brain exam. So the Kodak name is not on the film and the film contains the incorrect notches in the corner. Something that photographers are very attuned to because they work in a dark room. The black and white negatives are shot from a press pack. That is, they're numbered frames from a contiguous roll of film and they are ANSCO brand film. But Stringer used Kodak film, not ANSCO film, in duplex holders, i.e. not a press pack. So film that's put in a duplex holder is very thick film. The film that the brain uh, black and white negatives are on is not thick film. It's four, five, four by five inches, but it's not thick. It's very thin substrate. And the frames are all numbered, which means they come from a press pack. But Stringer didn't use a press pack. So, and finally, there are no identification tags present in any of the archives brain photographs. But Stringer recalls identification tags being present in all of the photographs he took of JFK's brain. So all of this evidence is dispositive courtroom evidence. Uh, that's what a lawyer would call it. Uh, this would be used in court to get the brain photographs thrown out of court. They would not be admitted as evidence by a judge because of this overwhelming evidence that they cannot be photographs of President Kennedy's brain, which were taken by John Stringer on Monday, November 25th. Now, here's the uh, diagram 
of one of the brain photographs. Half of the brain photographs are shot from the top, like this one, the superior surface. Half of them look just like this. So Ida Dox, the medical illustrator, made this diagram for the House Select Committee. FBI, Frank, FBI agent Frank O'Neill, uh, when he was deposed by the review board, was looking at this actual photograph depicted by this drawing. And he disowned and impugned this photograph under oath before the review board. The reason was that too much mass is present. He recalled under oath that over half of the brain was missing at the autopsy when he saw it removed from the president's cranium. And he said to Jeremy Gunn and I, this doesn't look like what I saw. He said, uh, this is a complete brain, isn't it? And Jeremy and I looked at each other and Jeremy looked back at Frank O'Neill and said, well, that's what we're asking you. And so Frank O'Neill repeated that this does not look like the brain he saw at the autopsy on President Kennedy. This is an FBI agent, a former J. Edgar Hoover loyalist and a trained observer. He had no motivation to lie about this. Both Frank O'Neill and Gawler's mortician, Tom Robinson recalled that significant mass was missing from the back, the rear of the brain at the autopsy when they saw it removed. Uh, and yet both hemispheres of the cerebellum are intact in this brain. As you look down on this image, on the right is the cerebral hemisphere. It is severely disrupted for whatever reason we don't know. We don't know if we're looking at bullet damage or cutting on, on the surface of a brain that had already been preserved. We just can't tell. So the cerebral cortex is disrupted, but most of the mass is actually present in the right cerebral hemisphere. All of the cerebellum is present. You will recall that in Dallas, the cerebellum was macerated extremely damaged, much of it was missing, according to Dr. McClellan, and part of it fell from the wound during treatment onto the treatment cart. So this cannot be the brain seen in Dallas. And it's not the brain seen at the autopsy at Bethesda, according to Frank O'Neill and Tom Robinson. Now, very briefly, uh, I'm gonna repeat a critical point made years ago by David Mantic. I'm sure he's gonna make this same argument with you in two weeks. The uh, superior view of the brain on the left, it's the HSCA drawing, when compared to the right lateral x-ray, or for that matter, with the left lateral, except there's no published image of the left lateral, are completely inconsistent. These two images do not equate. So there's a lot of tissue present on the left in the superior view of the brain, especially in the forebrain. You can see that 90% or more of the forebrain is present. It's completely present on the left side and on the right side, it's disrupted, but most of the forebrain is present, if not all of it. Uh, and there's still a lot of mass, a lot of tissue present in the right cerebral hemisphere. It's just disrupted. If you look at this X-ray, this right lateral X-ray, you see this huge dark region uh, in the top of the skull. And it's dark because there's no forebrain in the cranium. The forebrain is not present. And a lot of the right cerebral hemisphere is missing. This was confirmed by OD measurements, optical densitometry, and by experts, medical experts, looking at the skull x-rays under a hot light uh, in the archives. So Dr. Mantic will expand upon this, I'm sure. Now, why, why place false brain photos in the official record? This blatant fraud was easy to detect by 1996 and might easily have been discovered in 1964 during a proper investigation. The true damage inflicted in Dallas could not become part of the official record since JFK's actual brain would have revealed, and I'll just focus on the essentials here, uh, would have revealed shots originating from in front as well as from behind. In other words, a crossfire, inconsistent with the official cover story of a lone shooter from behind. Also, the true damage inflicted in Dallas could not become part of the official record because a large exit wound in the right rear of the head would have been confirmed by the large amount of missing brain tissue in the rear of JFK's actual brain, implying a fatal shot from the front. Now the damage inflicted upon the substitute brain seems generally consistent with the official cover story, that is of a lone shooter from above and behind in the school book depository. Although it is unclear from visual examination 
whether the damage in the brain photographs was inflicted by a bullet or by cutting. We just can't tell. The photos of the substitute brain placed in the official collection could be used, could be used, and in fact have been to discredit the Parkland medical testimony of an exit wound in the rear of the head, including severe damage to the right cerebellum. So the House Select Committee, one of the reasons uh, their forensic pathology panel uh, didn't have a lot of faith in the Dallas doctors was because the brain photographs in the archives didn't match the descriptions of damage to the brain that came from Parkland Hospital, which was that at least a third of the brain, the posterior brain was missing. So the photographs didn't match that description. And so that's one of the reasons that the HSCA uh, forensic panel uh, was not happy about what the Dallas doctors had said and chose to discount it. The implications are that doctors Humes and Boswell were present at both brain exams, which means they were fully complicit with the cover-up. Dr. Fink was a victim of the two brain exam cover-up caper. I repeat, doctors Humes and Boswell were present at both brain exams, which means they were fully complicit with the cover-up. Now, uh, much of the JFK medical evidence would be inadmissible at trial today. I'll go through this very quickly and you can uh, revisit this slide later. The surviving skull x-rays have been exposed as frauds, forged composite copy films, and would not be admitted at trial. Doctors Mantic and Chesser will expand upon this in the next two weeks. As many as 18 different views of autopsy photos known to be taken are missing today, making the surviving collection grossly incomplete and misleading. I published a study on this in, at the end of chapter four in my book. I examined all the testimony I could find and all the uh, interview reports of everyone who said they saw this and that and the other kind of photograph taken at the autopsies. And there are many, many different views missing. And when I say view, usually a view would encompass at least two black and white negatives and at least two color positive transparencies. So there are a lot of uh, photographs not in the collection that were taken. The severe damage seen to the top of JFK's skull in the so-called autopsy photos would be contradicted and impugned by the Parkland medical staff, thus revealing that it was really the result of post-mortem surgery at Bethesda. That's what we've been talking about throughout this presentation. The apparently intact back of JFK's head in some autopsy photos would be contradicted by both the Parkland medical staff as well as many or most Bethesda witnesses. These images would be severely contested at trial. None of the brain photographs, I emphasize none, would be admitted at trial. We've just discussed this, and I've laid it out in great detail for you in chapter 10 of my book. Now, finally, the third, the, excuse me, the current version, the current version of the autopsy report in the National Archives was only the third written version. The typed first draft was burned by Dr. Humes in his fireplace Sunday morning, November 24th, per his admission. And the first signed version is now missing also from the receipt trail, which I studied very carefully. This is all laid out in chapter 11 of my book. I don't have time to go into this. It would require a whole new presentation and we don't have time for that tonight. Now, finally, uh, a lot of key physical evidence is missing today. This is not a good state of affairs, to say the least, in the death of a head of state at the height of the Cold War. JFK's brain and crucial bullet and skull fragments are missing. I'm going to move through this very quickly in the interest of time and ask you to revisit this slide later when this is up online. Now, what's missing are bullets and bullet fragments, JFK's brain, and two key bone fragments, the Harper fragment and the Burroughs or Weitzman fragment. Let's go back to the top. The missing bullets and bullet fragments are an intercostal bullet, which is a bullet found between JFK's ribs per Paul O'Connor and Gerald Custer, which was not placed in evidence. Uh, Paul O'Connor, when he was readmitted to the morgue after being kicked out, after he was placed under guard for 40 minutes in the hallway by the Marines, he was told by one of the people inside the morgue that a bullet had been removed from JFK's ribs in his back from intercostal tissue. Of course, that never made it into the record and it's never mentioned in the autopsy report. Uh, 
Navy Corpsman Dennis David has uh, said for years that he typed a receipt for and handled four large bullet fragments, which he estimated consisted of more than enough mass for one bullet, but less than enough mass for two bullets. They were never placed in evidence. And in fact, the federal agent who asked him to type the receipt took the typewriter ribbon and all the carbon copies with him, along with the bullet fragments. They never made it into the official record and neither did the memorandum that, uh, the receipt memorandum that Dennis David typed. Mortician Tom Robinson recalled a vial filled with many tiny metal fragments from the brain, approximately 10 fragments. Uh, it was not placed in evidence. This is what he told the review board staff in 1996. Now, yes, JFK's brain is missing. Uh, many of you will know this already. Rear Admiral Berkeley, the president's military physician, took the brain from Dr. Humes on Monday, November 25th, 1963. He maintained custody and kept it in the stainless steel container. Uh, the container wasn't real large. It was six by eight inches, but there wasn't much left of the brain either. Uh, FBI agent Frank O'Neill said that the brain was more than half missing. And Berkeley confirmed later to the House Select Committee on Assassinations that the container did contain what was left of JFK's brain. Now the brain and all other medical evidence, photos and x-rays were given to Robert F. Kennedy, the president's brother, by Berkeley in April of 1965 at Robert Kennedy's request. An inventory was made of what they gave to Robert Kennedy at the time, and it was signed by Dr. Berkeley and by three Secret Service personnel. When RFK was forced to return the medical evidence to the US government at the end of October, 1966, the brain and all other items in paragraph nine of Berkeley's original inventory were not returned. I repeat, none of the items in paragraph nine of Berkeley's inventory were returned to the US government. This was noted by the National Archives personnel. In fact, they compared the Berkeley inventory with the deed of gift inventory made out by the Kennedy family when they returned the materials and they noted that all the paragraph nine materials were missing and they were so concerned. They wrote a memo about it on the day of receipt on October 31st, 1966 for their own CYA purposes. They wrote a memo that all of the materials in paragraph nine were not in the footlocker. Now Burke Marshall, the Kennedy family attorney who wrote the deed of gift, transferring these materials back to the US government, told the HSCA that RFK disposed of these materials himself, all of the paragraph nine materials, and said that he was certain that obtaining or locating them, quote, was no longer possible. I repeat, Robert Kennedy's attorney, the Kennedy family attorney, the watchdog of the medical materials, told the HSCA that RFK, who was deceased at the time, of course, he was assassinated in 1968. So Burke Marshall told the HSCA in the late 70s that RFK had disposed of these materials himself and that he, Burke Marshall, was certain that obtaining or locating them was no longer possible. Now the two uh, skull bone fragments missing are the Harper fragment, which we discussed earlier in the lecture, and the uh, so-called Burroughs fragment. This is the same fragment, I believe, that was referred to by Seymour Weitzman in an affidavit on Saturday, November 23rd. Berkeley was the last person to sign for these items. They were skull fragments from Dealey Plaza and they've disappeared. That doesn't look good for Admiral Berkeley. Berkeley was coordinating the processing of all autopsy photography that weekend and during the following week. And many photos taken at the autopsy are missing today, as I have explained to you. That doesn't look good for Admiral Berkeley. George Berkeley was retained as the president's military physician by LBJ and was promoted by LBJ from Rear Admiral to Vice Admiral. When he received that promotion, he was promoted to a rank co-equal with the Surgeon General of the Navy, which is kind of strange for a presidential position. But anyway, that's what happened. Now, in later years, Berkeley told two researchers, Michael Kurtz and Henry Hurt, that there was a conspiracy to kill President Kennedy, and he suggested that he did not agree with the number of headshots 
posited by the Warren Commission, which was only one headshot. When both authors, uh, Kurtz and Hurt, got back to Berkeley and wanted to talk about this again, he cut them off cold, said he didn't want to discuss it anymore. So he was a very much a left foot, right foot individual, very conflicted. At times he seemed to want to confess, at other times he uh, didn't want to talk about this anymore. So I concluded that he was a major player in the JFK medical cover. -up. Now, uh, in retrospect, uh, these are the, this is the summary of the Bethesda cover-up. I invite you to revisit this slide when this is online. I'm gonna go through this extremely quickly in the interest of time, because we've just covered all of these main points. So between 6.35 and 8 o'clock PM, there was clandestine surgical alteration, expansion of JFK's wounds to remove all metal from the body and to remove forensic evidence on the body and in the brain of frontal shots. Entry wound in the interior neck was expanded to resemble an exit. A gash was created, an unsightly gash. The entry wound high in the right forehead was excised. It was cut out with a scalpel, creating this enormous red incision in some of the autopsy photographs. The brain tissue containing a bullet tracks was removed from the forebrain and right cerebral hemisphere, thus accounting for Paul O'Connor's misperception at eight o'clock p.m. that there was no brain in the cranium. His memory of, of that dramatic uh, finding was closely associated in his mind with the time of eight o'clock, which is when he looked at a clock on the wall and logged in the body in the logbook. So this tells me he's got some uh, memory merge going on. He did see the shipping casket arrive early at 635, and he saw the zippered body bag removed from the shipping casket. But I conclude that he was told to leave the morgue at that point, and then he re-entered the morgue after the third casket entry at eight o'clock, saw the head unwrapped for the first time at eight o'clock, and that's when he made his observation, which was a subjective interpretation error, an exaggeration. Bullet fragments from the brain, four large fragments and approximately 10 tiny ones, and a bullet from JFK's back found in intercostal tissue were disposed of and not placed in the record. We just discussed that. Many photos of the body taken at the autopsy were not placed in the record, including probes in the body. Dr. Carney, a third year resident who was in and out of the morgue that night at Bethesda, clearly recalled probes in the body going into, and in some cases out of uh, wounds in the body uh, to denote the angles that uh, bullets traveled in. And he remembers numerous flash bulbs going off or strobe lights, taking pictures of probes in the body. He was very upset when we told him during his interview with us that there were no such photographs in the record. He was so agitated, he got very red in the face. This is a former Navy captain. He was an honorable man. Uh, the interior of the chest was photographed, according to Dr. Humes and Dr. Boswell. And uh, the interior and exterior close-ups of the rear entrance wound in the skull uh, are also missing. So photographs that are missing are probes in the body, the interior of the chest, those photographs are missing, and the interior and exterior close-ups of the rear entrance wound in the skull. Some photos of the back of the head show a dishonest image for one reason or another. It's either extreme scalp manipulation to cover up the missing right rear of the skull, scalp moved over from the left side of the head, or more likely, I think, uh, they're altered photographs. And I, I based that on Dr. Mantic's stereoscopic examination of very similar images. I trust his observation. Now, the fraudulent brain photos of someone else's brain were introduced into the official record. The authentic photos of JFK's severely damaged brain, including the serial sections were disposed of. We just discussed that in some detail. Skull fragments were disposed of, the Harper fragment and the Burroughs fragment. The official autopsy conclusions kept changing and two previous versions of the autopsy report are now missing. One was a first draft, which was burned by Dr. Humes and one was a signed version that disappeared along with all the other uh, paragraph nine materials uh, from the Berkeley inventory. Some skull x-rays were taken at the autopsy, but not placed in the record. So it looks like two or three skull x-rays known to have been taken are now missing. All three existing skull x-rays are altered copy films. 
as demonstrated by Dr. David Mantic in his optical densitometry studies and as confirmed by the observations made by Dr. Chesser with his optical densitometer. And they are not originals as purported. Now the right and left lateral skull films are whited out in the area of the rear exit wound in the back of the head. And the AP, the anterior posterior skull film, displays the false image of a purported bullet fragment in cross section, which matches the supposed murder weapon. How convenient. That artifact was not seen on the x-ray during the autopsy for the sworn testimony of all three pathologists to the review board. So this is your summary of what we've been discussing tonight. This is the final slide. I'm sure you'll note with some uh, relief. Uh, my final retrospective is that the biggest problems in the JFK medical evidence are evidence suppression and alteration of evidence. Evidence suppression, missing items, and alteration of evidence. I invite you to revisit this slide later uh, after it's online. So in short, I believe fraud in the evidence is the biggest hindrance to understanding the medical evidence, not incompetence. Now, certainly there was incompetence. Uh, doctors Humes and Boswell were not forensic pathologists. They did not shave the head to show the true nature of the wounds. Uh, they did not use fixed body landmarks to describe where bullet wounds were, especially the wound in the uh, back. Uh, and they made other mistakes. That's the HSCA explanation, their preferred explanation for what's wrong with the medical evidence and why there are so many conflicts is incompetence. I don't accept that explanation. I believe fraud in the evidence is the biggest hindrance to understanding uh, what happened at Bethesda Naval Hospital. Now, if the assassination were a simple murder, as the Warren Commission and its apologists would have one believe, no evidence suppression or alteration would have been necessary. I repeat, if this was a simple murder, as all the Warren Commission apologists would have us believe, no evidence suppression or alteration would have been necessary. That's something for all of you to think about after tonight's lecture. I want to thank you very much for your attention. I hope uh, people get benefit from revisiting this presentation and re-examining some of the slides. I thank you very much for your patience. Thank you very much.